What did you use to make that? Uh, it's an After Effects. After Effects has a bunch of 3D stuff now. That's cool. And so what, you just position the camera yeah, in various it, places? Yeah, it's all just keyframing the camera. And then, uh, not that I expect you to remember, but like, do you set it to a certain lens with a focal length of... Yeah, it has depth of field control, so when it's keyframing the position, it's also keyframing the focal length. Yeah. And um, the, the After Effects has um, uh, two-point cameras, so you see how it kind of focuses pretty strongly in the center of it in all of the movements. Sure. Uh, it's because the camera is moving, but the camera knows to keep looking at the center, basically. That's so, nice. So it's, it's so essentially like the whole tool is built to do exactly what we're seeing right now. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And and so what you upload a font, you extrude it, mm -hmm. and then uh, add some lights. Yeah. Um, I, they've got a good ray tracing. Twenty um, twenty five years ago, I had to do all this uh, manually and after or three uh, D Studio Max yeah. one uh, two point oh. I think it was two point oh. I guess. Uh, right I'm gonna share. I'll share it on the show. I mean, when we're on recording, mm -hmm. but uh, I made a, a, a thing. You know, by the way, I you know I'll be able to officially announce the Discovery Channel project. Oh, um, hey, uh, hey, that's convenient. Uh, by the way, uh, congratulations on your presence at San Diego Comic Con. Uh, Shark Week there with a vengeance, uh, complete with oh, really? flying around banners and whatnot. Oh, nice. Very cool. Yeah, I got some. They got some. They did. Press wise, some cool stuff coming up this week for me to do interviews and stuff. So, very cool. Um, um, yeah, we'll do a. I, I, I think we can send a photo. It's coming to up you. next week, right? Uh, August 2nd, actually. So, I got like another week or so to promote. So, it starts next week, but mine is August 2nd. So. Ah, okay. Very cool. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Ahoy. Welcome to Beautiful the show. Beautiful, mateys. My wife doesn't like it when I call her my matey. She, it seems like she would be the only person who would be okay with you well, calling I mean, a matey. I, mean, I, I, I think it's mainly because... Or do you also make we, comments about the booty? I de well, I definitely do a full-on impression of Justin Robert Young the entire time, and oftentimes it's mid-coitus, and she... she uh, like, matey! Uh, 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 I'm well, man, normally, man. Yeah, normally the impression <laughs> yeah. of me during coitus is, is an aphrodisiac, but then you throw in matey, which yeah. is something that I really say yeah oh, matey. we're I, mating Annie valley like now I, it's yeah you and me place. we're we're the mating mateys brian like don't high five and say that was a great night attack bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, don't do that it's not good not good uh, hurry. Uh, <laughs> cool all right i got that image that you sent me thank you very much andrew uh anything else you need to send me I don't know. Was that a hint? Yeah. Uh, what am I for something? No. What? I, what? I'm just. If there's anything you got now. Yo, guys, that's cool. be that professional Bitcoin? about this. What the? That what the F word is happening? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's good to see you guys again. Nice yeah. To see you. This is always the beginning of my week. The beginning of live streaming. Like, not yeah. to say that I don't do anything before this, but it's 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 a nice way. We all gather, exchange ideas. Get out there to the world. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah, let's get this going. All right. Uh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm with go. you. I'm with you. Let's go. It's almost 10 uh, till. I know. I just had this thought, though, of like how Bryce accidentally becomes like a mob boss. Was there anything else you owe me? People were like, oh, uh, uh, $500? Okay. <laughs> you know? And like do people just innocently, Bryce just becomes this like, you know, first I think he's a capo and this works his way up. Just a thought. <laughs> wow. Because there's a tone so... there. There's a tone. We need to talk about that one. Uh, all righty. Forward with this. Fine. <laughs> Fine. All right. You guys ready to do the show? Ready, ready. I love how you guys reinforce and work together. It's great. It's great. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, then uh, we can get started here in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by the comedy duo Brian Brushwood and Justin Robert Young. Oh, for the first time introduced as a unit. You're welcome, oh America. Well, you basically are. That's the thing I've realized. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, Hi everybody. Here I am on the knobs and forgetting to turn them on. So well, hello, and, and, and most importantly, it, it normally takes longer for to realize that uh, Justin and I are just a unit. <laughs> this, yeah. this is what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, real, real, real units. 
That's how we're off to big unit. Big unit. Absolutely. Big nuts. unit. Yeah, big Randy unit. got it. Uh, I heard something about adjustment being made. Uh oh. And adjustment. No, no, no. I said Randy Johnson. Randy Johnson, the pitcher's nickname was the big unit. No, no, I meant Bryce. Did you say you had to fix something there? Oh, oh no. no. Do you have to fix something? No, I was saying absolute unit. Wait, are are you definitely setting up a bit right now? This is all. This is all. Uh, uh, if there's adjustments to be made, we can make them. But uh, I'm. I'm okay, oh, no, right? I thought I should turn up. All right, I screwed that up. Hey, everybody, this is how it's made. <laughs> yeah. this is you, it. Right. you want to start all over from the beginning? Let's just let's just start all over. <laughs> it's experienced people, they make it. This is how I, and frequently when I do it, this is my <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Not very good at making it here. All right, here we go. From the beginning. Sure, it was Randy Johnson. Randy, I think yeah. he's the big unit. He killed that bird. He oh, did right, kill he that did. bird. I actually brought that up with Ashley, and I'm like, I, I, I immediately regretted it because I know she'd start crying if she ever saw <laughs> oh, no. You know his Wikipedia? I, I feel like his Wikipedia says something like, Randy Johnson's bird hitting was so uh, infamous, it is more well-searched Randy Johnson bird than Randy Johnson baseball. <laughs> the funny thing is, Randy Johnson looks like a bird. <laughs> Re- okay, hold on. He's got a very bird-like existence. All right, Andrew. Killed Discovery Discovery Channel's Andrew Maine. Uh, uh, you ready to <laughs> get started? Does it look like a bird? Wait, are we starting this? I'm let's start over. Let's, let, all right, all right. From the top. From the top. From the top. We got this. We got this. We got this. Super pro. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Well, hi, friends. How you doing? Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. I'm over here working the buttons. Uh, guys, it's good to be back. I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. Um, it was middle of travel. I went to Thriller Fest, uh, where I was nominated for the uh, ITW Thriller Award for Best Paperback Original, and I'm proud to say the best author won. Was not oh. me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it who, was, who, who did win? I forget. Um, oh. They weren't here there. I know that because they had somebody else have to go except for them. We can see this here. Actually, uh, uh, Jane Harper won for The Lost Man. Um, and congratulations. Uh, you know the concept of imposter syndrome? I, my joke has been like, I have imposter imposter syndrome. I don't feel I'm good enough to have the real imposter syndrome. So I just sort of like... So so you well, reject imposter syndrome. When, so, when, when your mind shows up at the door with a, a gold emblazoned plaque saying, congratulations, you have imposter syndrome, you're like, oh, no, no, no. Clearly, this is intended for somebody who's actually done enough to merit imposter syndrome. I was at a cocktail party and there's some writers talking and they're talking. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to, I don't want to go over there. No, small, a small party thrown by my publisher. And I'm like, uh, I just don't feel like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I have this sort of like, they're real writers. They're talking. I don't want to bother them, you know? And then I have people come, Oh, Andrew man, you got, look at this. You know, I just got a big plaque and all that for the number of reads from one of the books and stuff. So it's just a weird sort of thing is that, um, uh, you never feel like you make it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> At least in my case. That's uh, that's the betrayal. And I think we've talked about this privately. I don't think we've talked about it on the air. But it's like in the world of TV, first you um, uh, establish whatever the thing it is you do well enough that you feel like it deserves a TV show. Then you put together the pitch and it gets approved and you're like, oh, my God. And then you do a development reel and it gets approved. You're like, oh, my God, we did it. Now I just have to worry about uh, the pilot. And then you make the pilot and then you worry about whether or not it airs. Then the pilot airs. And then you worry about whether or not it's going to be picked up for series. Then you do the series, and then you just every year for the rest of your life wo- worry about whether or not the series is going to get picked up again. It 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 never ends. It's a never ending cycle. One step after the next. It's just that that you, you you the more you watch like stuff like comedians and cars getting coffee and things like this, and you see that like yeah, it's like oh, so and so big name, and they, and then that once you're known. You see people like that, and then they don't have a thing. That whole "What are you working on now?" becomes this, you know, the the feared question. You know, what are you working on now? It's like, oh, um, you know, things. And then, and part of the reason is like you get on talk shows when you have stuff going on. If you don't yep. have stuff going on, like now, modern big talk shows, they're like, Meh, what do they have going on? Nothing. And then it becomes a cycle. So, um, although, so, like, yeah. you would you'd think that in this era there could be a resurgence of like the, oh, let's just have this random comedian even if they're not doing anything on because there's so many talk shows. There's so many places that are doing, but I guess that's podcasting now. Podcasting well, is, is that new glut. 
But no, but there always was there was radio and there's that other stuff, but I'm talking like to do the top tier, that's the thing. And that and that's yeah. and that's how it's looked at from the inside, is that you can say like, you know, Going on Joe Rogan may be better than going on a late night show, really. But the perception in the industry is is that you have to you have know, a thing to be plugging. Otherwise, why are you on the Tonight Show, yeah. the Late Show? Yeah, the... if you're not on the Tonight, if you're if you can't go on the Tonight Show first to go plug it or whatever, it's like, well, geez, you know, that's that's sort of the thing. But um, you know, it's like you know, I, I, you can find interviews now. Like you can be somebody who was like, I watched a guy who was a big name that came out in the Me Too movement and on some small tier podcast because they'd have them. They don't care, you know, but that's not like his agent's going, oh, great. <laughs> we got you that podcast. I'll make sure Netflix sees this so we can get you new work, you know. Yeah. So, um, so I have a little thing coming up. Oh, a little thing? I, I, unrelated side story. Man, oh, man, I just got back from Comic-Con, and boy, does Comic-Con love uh, Shark Week. You heard of the Shark Week, Justin? Like, like oh, they, had, I, yeah. they had banners. People were walking around with these giant foam fangs, giant foam fangers, number one. Uh, it, it was amazing. Uh, people love the Shark Week. I'm sorry, uh, what, what was your thing, uh, Andrew? Oh, you heard of Shark Week? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, indeed, I have. Oh, well, cool. Um, I shot a special, which we talked about uh, a year ago. And, uh, you know, the plan was, oh, there, that was me in the promo. Wow. Um, uh, did not know that. <laughs> First time I've seen the promo package. Ha! Yep, yep. So uh, I, I, I came up with a crazy idea a year ago, uh, which was like, hey, I wonder, I'm a magician. I like to perform for new audiences. You know, I perform for, you know, uh, children's hospitals, old folks, uh, cruise ship audiences, resort audiences, TV audiences, international. And I'm like, you know, you know who doesn't get much street magic because they don't have any streets is Sea Life. <laughs> and I, and probably the, the one that gets no magic at all might be like sharks or maybe great white sharks. Fun fact, but, man. I had this same thought. Turns out fire eating, not great underwater. You can only use magnesium burning underwater, and uh, that's hard to put out with your mouth. So, See? Andrew, ever, ever the, uh, the, the, the giver, a man who brings his gifts to whoever needs them, uh, uh, what did you do to rectify this situation? Well, when you talk to the people at Discovery Channel, and it starts off with, like, I'd like to do magic for great white sharks, <laughs> um, the idea, the process evolves. Uh, what originally started off as an idea I had years ago, like, you know, it'd be really cool, it'd be like to, like, vanish or to try to make myself disappear, like, underwater, but for, like, regular audiences involve sharks and stuff. And then evolved into, like, well, forget the magic trying to do this. What if you just really focus on trying to fool the senses of a great white shark? Like, could there are some principles in magic that work? We have optic principles or some things that do, that do deceive. Can you deceive a great white shark? And this evolved into the idea of, you know, could I build a suit that incorporated a lot of different technologies to try to make myself invisible to effectively to confuse or make myself invisible to great white sharks, sharks and great whites in general. And, and um, to, uh, to be clear, like I assume that 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 uh, the marketing is going to say invisible to sharks or whatever. But in my mind, you're, you're, you're essentially cloaking yourself like the predator. Right. So like from the shark's per perspective, your goal is to look like the predator. I, I yeah, I played with dealt with built it evolved into a very high tech, sophisticated thing and then evolving to f see what would go through there, including digital mapping led stuff and then it set then then i evolved into let's do the special you'll see me trying to figure out like what's the most practical solution and you have you have x amount of time to get this done and so i try to come up with some stuff and work with shark scientists to figure out like what's the most effective way so in the special you're going to see me trying to evolve and design you can have a very cool concept and figure out what's going to work when you're 80 feet underwater surrounded by great white sharks and no cage which is spoiler alert it's where i ended up in the special um so it was did, an did, amazing did, did you die? experience. Did you What's die? That? Uh, I, I'm yeah, asking Brian. for spoilers. Like, did, did you die? <laughs> but the prosthetic is great. Did, so, did they, you know, <laughs> it's been great. Uh, I mean, did I run back into the cage, which there was none? I had to submersible. Did I, did I not get out? You know, did it, was there, you know, we don't, it's, it's, it's a matter of did the thing work or not? And that's the thing is I can tell you, I, um, Go ahead. Oh, yeah. And, and working can be like a hypothetical situation. Uh, what's the difference? Suit, no suit. 
Um, uh, you know, no suit. Did I have interactions with great white sharks that I did not want to have happen? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, have I had too many close encounters? Have I had more close encounters now that I want with very large apex predators, including tiger sharks and great white sharks? Because I put myself into situations that were dumb. <laughs> That's you're going to see. There's, there's, yeah, there's, so there's a lot to it. So it, it occurs I, to I, me. Look, oh, I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I was going to say. I assume there's a lot about your upcoming special that we can't talk about in advance. And it kind of makes me want to talk about a project that didn't happen that also involves sharks that we were very close to having happen on one of these networks with the three of us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a good enough story that I feel like we should share is, is the, the, the pitch that we had for the pilot. There's been a few. Well, I'm specifically thinking yeah. of, okay, but of before 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 we move off the special. I, I do just want to point out again, you know, for everybody, this is something that is really really awesome. Uh, uh, obviously, we were you know in communication while Andrew was shooting it, but there really are kind of two phases to it. Just to highlight it, there is the idea of the scientific concept of like, all right, we're using magic principles. How do you go and do it? How do you actually try to fool a shark? And then there is Andrew literally going and putting his money where his mouth is. Uh, by getting into the water by and testing all these different things. And from, I've not seen the special, but I know from the actual process, this was a legit process of trying multiple different versions of this suit and, and beyond the idea of where these would be, what engineering solutions there would be. There's practical solutions of like, how do we put it in the water? How does it function in the water? D do you move the right way? Like, uh, uh, is it actually doing what it should? Uh, there is enough of a problem to do that in the world of magic where you're just trying to fool people from a certain vantage point, it is that much harder of a challenge to then take some of those principles underwater with electronics and have the, the opposite side of failing uh, be not people being disinterested, bored or booing, but rather possibly a massive bodily injury from an apex predator there there. And let me get to the, the goal of this was this was that in uh, were there things that we know in magic in, and I've done this before with some research and some other organizations of like, are there things we know in magic that might help other people who are trying to use them for whatever purposes? And, and my curiosity was for people who are working on shark conservation efforts, because, uh, sharks are in a vital, vital part of our ecosystem and, and many species are threatened and their habitats, all of their habitats are under danger and, we have a lot of the challenges facing them and trying to understand them is helpful. And, you know, great whites are amazing. We know so very little about them. And part of the problem is the observation problem. And I was like, well, here are some technologies and things I'm familiar with. Can we apply these and to see if there might be a use here to help us with this to it's not it's you know, these these creatures are amazing. And and, you know, I had a wonderful, amazing experience, you know, in a. Uh, I was at, you know, I was at the Isle of Jaws. I was, you know, like the fourth person to ever been underwater outside of a cage there surrounded by great whites. And you see them to get to see them up close, which is phenomenal. And you realize, like, there's so much we just don't know about them. And there's so much we need. We need to protect them. We need to understand them. And one of the tools to be able to do that is to find out how we can observe them without interfering and et cetera. And so that was the core goal was like, what can we figure out? What can we do? to ultimately help us understand these things better and you know make sure they're going to be around forever. Uh, all right, so so let's let's make sure that everybody takes the time right now to put it in their Google Calendar. Uh, uh, we are all going to make sure that we tweet the living uh, uh, heck out of all this. Uh, Andrew, when when are we watching your Shark Week special? August 2nd, 9 p.m. Uh, that's going to be as far as... Uh, it's Discovery Channel, so I assume it's going to be the same wherever you are in the U.S. I'm not sure. Internationally, it's going to be different times there, but that whole night's going to be great. Isle of Jaws, Blood Brothers. Uh, that's a that's a pair of great whites that always hang out together, and it's very atypical behavior for um, whites. Uh, and uh, I've seen them in the flesh, by the way. Uh, I don't know if oh, I'm those, say the, that. those same day, did you get an autograph? You get a selfie? With, I guess you did get a selfie with them because <laughs> I, I yeah, assume I actually, there were cameras yeah, around. <laughs> 
Yeah, I did, did. Uh, and then my special, and then I was Prey, which is, it's sort of like people looked at that like, oh, that sounds like your your whole experience. And I'm like, yeah, so it's going to be a great night, but Shark Week's fantastic. We've got 20 programs. You've got a lot of great comedians. Rob Riggle's going to be hosting a ton of stuff. It's going to be a great, you know, you know, it's going to go on for like two weeks, great two weeks of content. So just watch it all. But especially yeah, yeah. Uh, so Andrew Maine Ghost Diver is the name of the special. Uh, uh, that's if you're looking for your DVR or whatever. Make sure that you find Andrew Maine Ghost Diver. That is the uh, August second at 9 p.m. a Friday. We gotta make sure that we that we that we put this one out there, especially on social. Uh, uh, you guys you guys know the drill. We, we 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 thankfully we've been through enough television shows and specials to know know what we need to do. Let's make sure we use the appropriate hey, uh, uh, Yeah, real real, I, real quick, like like uh, inordinately powerful is is the pull of social media, and this is me speaking only for Brian Brushwood. I have nothing to do with uh, Andrew's project or anything. I'm gonna say that in my experience, there is an outside level of attention paid to social media responses on stuff. So no matter who it is, no matter what they're saying, a whole bunch of people talking about one thing and then very few people talking about another thing, they're going to look at the one thing and it might supersede what the actual viewership numbers are and affect things going forward. So you, me, and I, I, I can't speak for you guys. I can't speak for the rest of the weird things. Me personally, I intend to make a lot of noise on all social media about Andrew Main Ghost Diver. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you. Do you want to see? We can show for our, our live audience here. I can show a photo of uh, the latest version of the final suit that's had some modifications since then. But if we can show people what, what it ended up looking like. Oh, my God. So, uh, yeah. Is, is it, um, doggone it, I'm trying to figure out which DC supervillain you look like. Those, the <laughs> Ray from Aquaman, Stingray. Yeah. Black but Manta, it's Black Ghost Manta. Diver, guys. Yeah. It's Ghost Diver. Hey, uh, yeah. It's Night Monkey. Yeah, no, it's it's a, a Black Manta meet Death Trooper meet Iron Man meet uh, a few things, but yeah, you know, like that weird robot in Star Wars too that had the, where they found the the sand crawler. But it's a very yes. The per yeah, the purpose is the the materials and stuff, and and I'll, I'll get into get into a bit about the special about it, but like. You know, it's not just visual. It's about sound. It's about smell. There's a lot of things. EMF. There's a ton of little things going on, you know, beneath the surface there to try to, you know, lower my, you know, my my profile. So it's, you know, I describe it. I've been describing it, it's like it's an underwater self suit. You know, there's a visual component to it. But um, and anyhow, it is. Uh, uh, it was fun. And it's fun because it, what's neat is like. You feel badass when you're, you know, 80 feet underwater and you're surrounded by great whites and you're wearing this thing. But then you think like. Oh no, they can eat through this thing with no problem because it is not <laughs> it's not like impact armor and I and I didn't wear the I didn't put any uh, the shark chain mail on because it was going to weigh me down too much. So it's like, oh no, that's that's it's like tissue paper to them because it's yeah, designed no. to Yeah, this was designed to do a thing, not to protect a thing. Yeah. Like that and, and, and they're oh man, I I can't wait to see it. Uh, I can't wait for everybody else to see it because it, if it captures just even a fraction of watching, uh, you know, some of those tech tests and and uh, uh, all the different versions of the suit, all the different planning that went into it. It is going to be an amazing, so, uh, so, an amazing yeah. television uh, can, experience. Can I dangle in front of the Weird Things audience the prospect, the the non-zero prospect that that if this special does super well, phone's going to ring and they're going to say, "What else do you got?" And it is my hope that we could revive. An idea we had two, two or three years ago. I forget when that that was very close to getting piloted. Where uh, uh, maybe, maybe you know, Andrew's still the star of the Andrew Main Show, but 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 he brings in his two friends. Oh, I'll, I'll put somebody else in the suit, Brian. Next time around, it's you. Next no, time no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so the idea that we had pitched was an old weird things idea. We talked about the the shark uh, around Florida named Old Hitler. Because he had what looked like a swastika uh, tattoo on his fin, very likely was the result of a, a, a propeller blade uh, carving him up. But we were talking about the quest for old Hitler, and we our suggestion for a pilot episode was that we build a submersible, a submarine, but we shape it Bugs Bunny style, like a female version of the shark to seduce old Hitler, and we go try to find old Hitler. That would be an amazing Shark Week special. Yeah. Um, the... 
We can talk. I, 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 it's fine if I'm the only one who feels this way. It's fine. It's fine. No, no, I, I've, I haven't gone through the process now of, of them and, and, and having, and, and, you know, we've had at one point you brought up old Hitler and we had somebody said, oh, we found out it's been done. And you're like, it's been oh, done. Like, nobody's made, coach. nobody's it's made done. it. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, you know, there, but yeah, I, uh, there's other animals too. I, I may have had discovery suggest to me. <laughs> stuff where I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> I don't, you know, this is a really great one-time thing, guy. For, for there, the record. There's something magical. There is something magical to Shark Week that you know, and you guys have both been through the television pitching process, the television production process, that at a certain point is very blue sky. It's a bunch of people sitting in a nice air-conditioned room where they're just tossing out ideas because you're thinking about what's going to be telegenic. And at some point, the beauty of Shark Week is that Andrew's alone without any protection as as sharks are swimming next to him. And it's like, oh, yeah, what was really like we're all high fiving each other in the brainstorming session about how cool would it look if uh, somebody without protection had a shark right next to him. And then you're there. I I did have I I didn't in the with the gray white side, Andy Casagrande, by the way, amazing, amazing, uh, shark photographer. He's been in a number of discovery channel specials. He's fantastic. So that was very clear is that, uh, I did have him, which helped a lot, but yeah, there is that, like you're, you're, you're on the phone pitching something like you're pitching a plot line for something. And then you realize, no, this is your life. This is actually (laughs) going to be your life. And then you get off the phone and you're like, Oh geez. You know? And like, you know, originally I was going to have a shark cage and then they got banned. And then it was just that the whole evolution from like <laughs> what was going to be the super safe theatrical illusion underwater to next thing you know, you're getting, you know, great whites coming up to say hello to you. <laughs> like, it's just one of those things where you just know at the memorial service, no executive's going to step up to the mic and say, yeah, but that pitch was dope. It was a really good idea, like in the room. Oh, well, my God. you know, we it, could. I mean, I could see we could do a build show that would be around this. You know, like more of doing the different stuff. I mean, that's you know, for audiences out there, you know, for everybody listening, like here's the thing: is like the one of the things about TV is that you watch an hour episode of something or you watch, you know, 12 episodes of a thing, you know, uh, that Justin worked on, Brian did or whatever. It's a year, you know, it's a year of your life and not just the shooting of it, but the planning and the, yes, the pilot stage. And then by the time something, this was the fastest I've ever had anything go to air. Uh, and even the taking as long as it did, the fastest it took to get, to get the green light to go shoot, but you can have stuff that takes forever. And, you know, you reach a certain point where you can go in and you can pitch and people be like, oh, let's hear more. Let's hear more. And then it becomes a long process. But you know, we can talk because, like, I mean, you know, we could we could do our, our crazy sort of like build show of us doing stupid stuff. Well, I'll tell you, you what. In the I mean, meantime, Brian's already got one called Modern Rogue, I should point out. But <laughs> we could do a do a, you know, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll uh, <laughs> In the meantime, you can support this show, Patreon.com. I, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> uh, you can support the show, Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Head on over there right now and make sure that you kick in a little coin to keep us loud, live, and independent right here. Every single Monday, you can uh, uh, make sure that you get the After Things program before anybody else. That is where we talk about not only uh, uh, how we do our independent media careers, but also give advice to anybody that wants uh, opinions on it. And uh, every once in a while, peel off a few opinions of uh, popular media and culture the way that only we can. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, you know, it's funny as uh, Bryce put in a thing in the uh – the the chat section here, which is a link to an article we did about Legend of Old Hitler. That's one of the things that's happened. We've had producers come up to us and go, oh, what about this thing? Or what about this thing? And they send us links. 
And they're from weirdthings.com, you know, our own site. We're like, yeah, no, we know about this because that's our website. Like, oh, we, wow. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, we, we definitely like, uh, you know, uh, Jason does the bulk of the research for Modern Rogue ideas. And, um, you know, as we have started doing articles at themodernrogue.com, uh, increasingly as he's researching topics, it comes up and it's like the the module of authority is something that was created under our umbrella already or either yeah. that or, or it's a old scam school episode that we did. Uh, so, uh, moving away from sharks, which I'm totally cool to do by the way. Um, Saturday, Saturday was an anniversary folks. Saturday was the day we blew up the moon. Mm hmm. Any of you, uh, any of you, watch some of the the coverage, the 50th anniversary of Apollo? I didn't. I I, I did watch uh, Apollo 11, the documentary. Of course, we talked about it previously that we watched uh, First Man, which, by the way, uh, showed up on HBO on exactly the 50th anniversary. Nice job, HBO. Um, also, Hulu got the new CNN, that CNN documentary that you oh, liked. Oh, wonderful. Is, Apollo is, 11. Is, is it on Hulu now? It's or on coming Hulu to, now. Oh, that's great. Highly recommended. Yeah. Highly recommended. Thoughts? Um, yeah. Overrated. It's fake. We never went. Uh, I mean, yeah, geez. I mean, uh, amazing. Uh, the, the more the more that you read into that entire process and the more you watch, especially now, I mean, so much compelling content has been created around it. It's it's a miracle, you know, uh, and, and it is in our in our vantage point at 2019. It, it seems more and more like the the marriage between the apex of the period science and jackass you know like in terms of how dangerous and rickety uh, compared to our modern world everything sounds you what? know oh, i ahead. i of all the of all the presentations all things done, I, I i do think apollo 11 may be the best that documentary because it's all original footage they found 65 millimeter footage that had never been publicly shown before the only there's editorial choice of where the you know what shots they're going to use, but it's all original footage, all original sound ups. The musical score is different, and every now and then they'll do a graphic to sort of show you what's going on. But it's very much feel and they the, the 65 millimeter is great because it makes something that happened 50 years ago feel relevant and modern because just you look at the images, you look at the people, and they feel much more. It doesn't feel like old old footage other than you know maybe the colors but it is really really well done and you just start to appreciate the size of it but also this big huge operation to all of a sudden you know hear two guys walking around the surface of the moon and you look over at the limb and you realize you know like holy cow they're a quarter million miles away from earth and they've got to get back into this thing go into orbit meet up with the columbia go back towards earth you know and re-enter i mean all the things they have to all the things that have to go right all of the things 1969 technology and and just it's an it's an it, it was i was just speechless at points yeah uh, uh, uh we talked about it previously but it's like i full-on broke into tears watching this documentary and and yeah. the moments that always got me were those sweeping moments when you really processed the number of human beings who dedicated so many years of their lives uh, to make something truly extraordinary happening ha happen. It was it was it was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, have you have you guys heard about this upcoming Ronald D. Moore series uh, for all mankind? You guys know about mm -hmm. this? Uh, yeah, the I'm, Apple series. Yeah, I'm super stoked about it. Uh, the conceit, for those who don't know, is what if we lost that space race to the moon? What if what if America was still hungering for the next, you know, victory flagpole? And what if we continued to pour money into a black hole um, uh, y y to 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 make extraordinary uh, scientific achievements happen? Um, I I dig it. Uh, Ronald D. Moore, in general, really good storytelling. Yeah, I'm very curious to see see this. Uh, you know, I, I think that we we're, we're getting a more. That's a good reminder. I think we're we're now looking more up to think of like why don't we go further and why don't we go there more? You know, and and, and the thing that you know gets forgotten is in in its era, Apollo was controversial because it was cost so much. It was such a huge part of the of the budget. It was not the whole world. The whole world was together on that moment that man stepped foot on the moon. But up until then, it was not. And and we think we're divided today. And actually, there was an interview with Buzz Aldrin where they're talking about, well, today's divisions. And Buzz is like, 
we were in Vietnam, <laughs> you know, yeah. when this happened. You know, we were, you know, we had riots on campuses and violence that today, you know, we have issues, but not like that. Well, I, you remember in First Man, they 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 showed that footage from uh, the the poem Whitey on the Moon. Uh, that was, I yeah. mean, it was like there was a legitimate case to be made with what the hell are you doing going to the moon when we have these level of problems right back home. Yeah. Yeah, and that was you know that's and that's a thing that gets sort of brought up again and you know and not to, not that we want to get too much on the soapbox right now, but there is anytime you're pushing technology forward, you know, particularly if it's not just building bombs but building things like for humans and space and stuff, we see those benefits. You know, there are there are millions of people alive today because of things that technologies that have come as indirect results of that and medical technologies from things like dialysis machines and other stuff that were directly affected by these sorts of technologies. And then that's sort of the beautiful thing is, you know, people like, why bother? It's like, well, if we set ourselves on this big goal, like going to the moon, you get these other things that come out of it. And you can just say, well, you could just fund that research directly, which is maybe an answer. But sometimes in trying to solve the problems of putting humans in space, you know, the human civilization is built upon the idea of allowing us to adapt and live longer in environments that are hostile to us or improving the quality of our lives. And you get those benefits. So, you know, I, I think, you know, yay space. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> we're always having those discussions, but I don't know. Um, it is, yeah, exciting. Oh, uh, uh, did, did I see right? What, was it just over the last week or maybe over the last two weeks? Um, SpaceX came out with a more detailed explanation of why that uh, uh, that escape module capsule exploded. Yeah. So the there's a guy who the Scott Manley does really, really good YouTube videos, breaking things down and explaining a lot of that. He's, he's actually got a background in I believe, astronomy or physics he's super smart about this he does really good jobs of explaining this stuff down you should check out scott manley's channel but basically what it is is you have a you have a, a helium pressure tank that that provides pressure to push the fuel through the rocket engines that's how you you know it's because it's not like just gravity pulls these things through you have to have pressure so they use helium to apply pressure to the fuels in this case you have a couple different combustibles to mix and apparently one of the combustible materials worked its way back up through like a valve that wasn't supposed to wasn't supposed to go through. It was a one way valve, but it made its way through that valve and got into this other metalwork there, which is can be extremely basically some of the combustible fuel got up in there. And so once the, the helium was released, it created pressure and that fuel exploded within that valve, you know, outside of that valve. Right. Um, so they fixed it basically using valves because these were valves meant to be reusable that you just turn them off or on, but they pulled those out and now they're putting these basically these blast through valves that you just blow through the one time use ones, which is what they normally use. And, you know, it's one of those things that SpaceX, you know, has made a design choice for reusability and they're like, we're going to yank that out. You know, they've had to make a lot of choices to get away from reusability to get this thing to work and eventually it can work them back in, but... Well, they figured out what it was. Uh, I, I remember at the time when we were hearing about it, of course, it was all speculation on our end. But it's like what we wanted most to hear was it was Gary. Gary forgot yeah. his Brillo pad and it exploded. Uh, but but instead, it was a design problem. But uh, from a PR perspective, they did a good job of saying it's this one thing. We've replaced all of them. Not a problem anymore. And, well, uh, yeah, and, it, and it's it's a design issue where they tried a new design, in, but we already have a we have a solution that works that's been worked well for thousands and thousands of rocket launches that we've been using for you know sixty years. And they said we're going to try this different thing, which was worked great. But in this instance, they're like, no, we'll go back to the old, we'll we'll go back to the original thing because, you know, the thing that should have worked didn't work. But that was an area they had of concern that, that there's maybe an issue here. And then it went like, yep, you know, this is this is why you put things on the stand and you test them. You know, you just hope to find them earlier, not later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. So NASA seems satisfied. You know, the the Crew Dragon's moving forward. We, we, they're going to do an in-flight abort test next, which is going to basically take off, have that capsule eject from it and then land. And then uh, if that tests out well and they feel satisfied, then they're going to put, you know, astronauts on board. And, you know, probably, you know, probably not going to happen later this year, probably be next year. You know, the, the crude flight, not the abort test. 
Yeah. Oh, we're getting Scott Manley's bona fides. He has a degree in physics, astronomy, masters in computational physics. He's really qualified, folks. <laughs> he's he's a great explainer. He's super super qualified to explain this stuff. We also been having developments with Starship. You know, Elon Musk has said so. They've built their Starship as the next generation. You know, amazing, fully reusable, and uh, they did a test fire of this new Raptor engine, which is a methane engine. Um, they had a big fireball, and people were like, "Oh my God, it blew up!" Like, nah, it just was it's methane blowing. You know, methane blowback, but really wasn't much damage. But Elon has said that the Starship, which is actually the full stack of the full size, full stack thing, he says we may have test hops, test flights of that in two to three months. Oh wow, that's quick! Holy cow! Uh, or two to three months after the next, yeah, to clarify that. Um, after oh, wait, it achieves no. orbit during the Yeah, test. they said, yeah, orbit after that. So he's looking at trying to go orbital next year. What was the, uh, what was the quote that he said? Uh, it was something about uh, regulation saying that it would quite literally, they'll be faster to actually go to Mars than to seek approval that they believe they could go to Mars. <laughs> Which Well, yeah, they are working with, you know, the, the the challenge NASA has to deal with is that you you can get a, a, a presidential administration vice president Mike Pence to who are super ambitious about space going towards Mars and Moon. You could not have asked for the probably the most pro that we've had in years on that. But it, you need you know as a democracy as it should be you need Congress to approve the funding for this, and that's been the challenge. And NASA can say, yes, great, we want to do this, we can make this thing happen, but we need $40 billion authorized authorized in the next you know, 24 months. And you know, look at how long it takes us to reach a budget deal. You know, Look at how long it takes to do these things. And maybe it's good that it takes, I don't know. I mean, you know, because you could say like, well, you know, I don't know. But the point is, is that's the problem, is that it's not like NASA gets to say, well, we've got a $20 billion budget, we're going to do it for whatever we want. They're told, you know, Congress says you will spend the money on X, Y, or Z. And to get that money means a lot of horse trading. It's a, you know, it's no coincidence that your biggest NASA facilities are also, you know, where the most important people on the space sciences committees, you know, constituents live. Yeah. So it's politics. But yeah, I think, yeah, Elon's point was like, yeah, we could probably get get there. And part of it is it would be great for NASA to fund like Starship to put money into program more programs like that. But it's so crazy and out there, you know, Elon Musk is like, maybe we should just go build this thing and show it works. And then, you know, they'll come knocking the, for that. There, there does come that tipping point where all of a sudden it is profitable, not not just like a non crazy idea, but actually profitable to just go and say, hi, we're on the moon. Uh, uh, who wants to give us money? <laughs> you know, because we yeah. can do this, apparently. <laughs> Well, yeah, because there's a difference between, you know, the way that things have previously gone is, all right, let's go to these companies and uh, let's do a made to order whatever we want to do blank. Please give us uh, that and then just hit us with the bill later. Cool. And all the money in the world. We'll figure it out. Uh, here's, you know, we'll figure out how to, how to settle up. But I mean, and obviously what uh, SpaceX can offer and, and any of the other you know, Blue Origin uh, and the like is. No, this isn't. You're not funding our R and D even necessarily. You can wait until we have a functioning product, and you can just say, "Order me up one of those that already has a set price." But it'd be nice if you funded our R and D. Now it'd be nice, you know. You know who doesn't like a little help here and there? <laughs> well, that's uh, so. That's the next topic I want to get to. Is things are expensive, and like even like AI research, right? You know, every now I've been following a lot of stuff like with voice generation and stuff. And you know, we talked about a while ago, like Adobe had the Voco thing, which could like take thirty minutes of anybody's voice and create a really good voice model of that. And we never saw that. And part of it is that like to build that model, it takes you know a week worth of supercomputer training, and and that will improve. But it's expensive, and the costs on that are expensive and enormous. OpenAI, which was an initiative founded by a number of people, initially including Elon Musk and others, to basically be a, a nonprofit dedicated to researching AI, creating benevolent AI, and uh, has been doing some exciting stuff. We've talked about a lot of OpenAI stuff. They made a big shift a couple months ago. They they changed. They went from like a strict nonprofit status to a different one, which basically is sort of a semi-private, semi-profit nonprofit status, which is you know, raised some questions about like, okay, what does this mean? Um, and part of that is addressing the fact that for OpenAI, the problem is is if 
recruiting. If you're trying to recruit the top artificial intelligence researchers in the world, there are a lot of wonderful opportunities with companies where you're going to get stock shares and other stuff like that, where you know you look like you might be participating in the next Google versus working for a nonprofit. So OpenAI shifted the way they worked to basically in large part for recruitment. And now today they've announced a partnership with Microsoft, like a billion dollar, million year partnership with them to develop technologies for the Azure platform, which, you know, question is, you know, is the, is this fundamentally different than, you know, where we thought OpenAI was going, or is this really the way it has to go in order to make these things happen? You know, I mean, one hand, I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm left with sort of the impression where it's like, um, I feel like uh, AI wants to succeed, and the method by which it succeeds is sort of immaterial to me. Like whether it goes mm -hmm. through a corporate hands or government controlled hands or or independent creator hands, like eventually it still becomes uh, uh, sentient and starts to command humans. So well, sure the the. One of the things that gets brought up, though, is so OpenAI is working towards the idea of the AGI, the artificial general intelligence, which would, you know, the idea of that is, and we may find that this is a, a very far away from where we're, we're, what we need or what we want. But the idea is that an AGI is just a really, is a very, imagine, you know, it's, 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 it's a human with, you know, I'm making it like a queue of a thousand, you know, and you're like, hey, design a car. It designs you a car. Like, hey, you know, look at this, you know, figure out how to look at this, you know, uh, the HIV virus, figure out, you know, what's, uh, and look at all these medical records, help us figure out a way to cure this. Let's have a conversation, all that. So AGI would be able to work with anything you use a human brain for and AGI could work on, but also the idea that it would be, you know, could exponentially more smart than humans are, you know, a group of a, a you know, AGI, a AGI working on something could be like all of Google and Microsoft and national science foundation trying to solve a problem. And the problem is, or the problem is that yes, once we have it, we have it. But we don't have it. If Google has it and Google says, hey, we got this AGI, it's damn brilliant at figuring out, you know, Bitcoin pricing for the next, you know, you know, next four weeks or whatever. It's super, super accurate at that. And then or stock market stuff. And now the fear is among AI researchers that the person who develops the AGI will quickly amass such an economic advantage over everybody else, you know, because all of a sudden this thing can start filing patents on things that are really good patents, really good ideas on stuff, drug discovery, all this, and doing this in mass, that all of a sudden the accumulation of capital starts to go towards who has this. And that's the idea of if, you know, the Chinese develop an AGI before us, is this good? I'm not sure that it is because it all comes to how people are incentivized, you know, so. That's interesting because uh, you bring up an idea that uh, like I was not like, uh, I don't care if a uh, Coke or Pepsi wins, but the idea of another country, especially a, com a country that has objectively stated its goals to, you know, supersede uh, the United States, that, that, that does sort of, that, that changes things. <laughs> Well, and and even even from uh, a, a a company point of view, and and I would I mean the three of us are very much on the same page as far as what we believe in markets and things like this is that Facebook and Google are among two of the most powerful companies in the world, right? The fear is the or the, fear, uh, the the concern is that the company that has figures out AI like Google figured out search or Facebook figured out social won't just be another Google or Facebook sized company. It's going to be an exponentially bigger company than them and growing faster. And the things that we worry about now with, and I think a lot of it's irrational, but the things we worry about with them become even faster. And, you know, there, there's, it's, it's, and I don't know, I'm not, I'm trying to be a fear monger here or whatever. I, but I don't want to be the person that just goes, man, they're, they're, they're make they're just, you know, exaggerating the problem or whatever. Cause we don't have to know, you know, we, every week you, you find new re artificial intelligence papers and you see stuff where computers do things like, oh, wow, we thought that was totally undoable 20 years ago. You know, like, and then we go like, ah, it's not happening fast enough, but damn, if, you know, my voice assistants are really smart now at understanding more complex questions and stuff. So I, yeah. I have a similar yeah. thought about automation, or at least I have a, a parallel thought to that mm -hmm. in, in, in that, like, you know, uh, we we talk about like um you know a long term economy where there are less jobs because 
automation and, and new me mechanical technologies make it so we need less people to make or produce the same things. And at least, at least for me, you know, one of my concerns is like it, the the technology that goes into place to enable those new, I don't know, societal systems are gonna be owned by by the people who run these companies, and and I don't know that that will necessarily spread out to all of the people. I, I you mm -hmm. know, it's not necessarily just just that jobs are gone, but that there's still no incentive. There's still profit motive incentives. Uh, in in that system and so I, I think the ai thing is a very similar concern where you know you, you suddenly need less people but there's still not a lot of incentives to make yeah you know, i, I to give it, dividends to a, society it's a valid thing you know coming having to spend some time in india where you know the, the the expression i forgot who it was it said you know the future's here it's just unevenly distributed and and i felt that you know i felt that like you know, and I, the benefits that I feel here in my my Burbank apartment or home in Florida or wherever, you know, there or living in a nice environment, and all that. But I go half a mile and I see people who don't experience that or I go around the world and it's like, don't you know, the future is here. We have solutions for all of these things. But for whatever reasons, it's not evenly distributed. And then that beca that's the big question of, of course, you know, like, ah, oh, we have this wonderful system <laughs> that'll work now for redistribution. And maybe it doesn't work but but it doesn't mean that we should ignore the question and then i think bryce like yeah like what happens when it's we're talking about trillion dollars of wealth yeah and i think that that's that's the fear with both ai and automation is that like once that dog is off the leash is there any catching it like yeah. it, and and for for automation it's like okay well once you replace certain key sectors of our of our economy with you know self-driving cars or or other technology that is already kind of here just not at the level that it would need to be it w where does that go you know like i mean it, it certainly is never coming back like what happens in, in a world where we've already seen certain sectors just totally die because we've seen a technological change what happens if we see three or four of them within 10 years and then what happens if the ai that's behind it there's like no, we, we become so dependent so fast and there are, you know, hell, you, you compared this to Apple and, or sorry, uh, Google and Facebook, Andrew, and it's like, there's no shortage of Google and Facebook employees that complain about the same things that we complain about with Google and Facebook, but yeah. it's like, we can't do anything. The machine's too big and that's just a bunch of humans, let alone uh, having so much of uh, uh, their jobs taken over by the you know decision-making robots that are making the right decisions. Yeah, um, I'm excited about it, and I think that you know the, the the greatest age of humanity may be upon us. And it you know it's and but it is that that you know we we move towards what we're incentivized towards. You know when we started you know this American experiment, one of the things that's built into our country is the idea of checks and balances. You know, and and that's why you know we've we've <laughs> despite what the headline said, we've avoided tyranny because. There's checks for power and stuff, but when you talk about you know this thing that, and I have friends who are like, oh, it's overblown. People worried about atomic energy like this, and they worried about all that. They said this was the thing, and it's like, yeah, but the people giving the warnings back then weren't the ones as deeply involved as the people working on it. And when it's the people building AIs are really really worried. You know, that's a thing where I'm like, yeah, what? that was that was what Wired magazine said about the Y2K bug. It's like unlike previous doomsday scenarios, the people who are worried about the Y2K bug are the engineers who know the most about the Y2K bug. So I I, I don't know that that particular well, argument we, holds much sway it, with it, me. Did we do nothing about Y2K or did we rewrite tons of code upon Y2K? I, uh, yeah, I'm just saying that that particular argument that uh, uh but this time it's the smart people who are worried yeah, we, i've heard I, that I before i i don't i don't we don't again the, the 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 problem with the analogy of the y2k bug was we did a lot of stuff to mitigate that and i don't know that did we need not to did we need to rewrite software for for 727s did we need to rewrite healthcare database stuff did we need to not do that i i'm not going to make that argument that we didn't need to do that but also like you know, the Y2K bug was a thing that we, you know, was like three years before nobody cared about the you know, four years. Then it became this big thing. And and there was a certainly there was there wasn't an industry of people trying to prey upon those fears. That was part of it, though, was the people that the big part of the fear was coming from like, oh, I know this. This is why you need to hire my company to solve your Y2K problem. People were incentivized towards the fear. 
And here, some of the people who are the biggest advocates are the ones incentivized towards R&D of this, not because they're saying, we're going to mitigate it and stop it, but they're like, well, we're working on it, but I don't know. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> no one know. does. No one does. Uh, the first person to know will be the AI that tells us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the uh, Superintelligence, uh, the book by uh, Nick Bostrom. Nick, Nick Bostrom. Yeah, it's 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 really. I, I I recommend it if you're interested in the topic. I have like my I'm like oh you know. Mr. Bostrom, all right, you know, I, I think I, you're wrong yeah, about this. Uh, you but you know what? I, I think you, you tend to soft sell your recommendation of reading that book. Uh, uh, previously, you've mentioned that, like, if you're into wonkiness, go for it. But but I think it stands on its own. I really enjoyed it. I, I think uh, people yeah. should read it uh, full stop just so you're familiar with stuff like the paperclip yep. argument. Yeah, no, I totally – yeah, I, I agree because he's got a – it is a wonderful – and I was just trying to say that, like, Despite my kind of like, Meh, I'm like, no, read the book. It's like it's like The Martian. I'm like, oh, there's no windstorms on Mars, but it's a great, inspiring book. You know, right. I've met people at NASA who read The Martian and became bio botanists at NASA, and so I could be like, man, the science is this, and it's like, yeah, well, people were inspired and did real things. What have you done, Andrew? Put on it, some plastic armor and played with sharks. Yeah, I guess I guess it's not so much a recommendation so much as an announcement that it's required reading. If you intend to have a st uh, have a position in the AI debate, you got to yep. read Superintelligence. Yeah. Yep. 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 Agreed. 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 Uh, do we want to? Uh... Oh, man, I just wonder. Do you see the thing about AI portraits that came out today? No. It's this new website. Hold on. I'm, I'm gonna load it up. AIPortraits.com. Wait, is there a is it is this a face app thing? Should we not be using AI portraits? Oh no, this only go. It, this is North Korean developers. Nothing to do with the Russians. Oh, You're fine. Okay, North okay. Korean. <laughs> no. But this is a uh, this is similar to face app. You upload a portrait, and oh man, it's taking a long time to load. Probably because it's being. Although here, well, well, Bryce, while well, while you while you pull that up, hmm. if the North Korean government and it was listed in the Apple Store as like the People's Republic of Korea. Uh, uh, you know, we have made an app where you can put Kim Jong Un's haircut on your dog. <laughs> like, oh wait, what is this? Hold on, what's the I, what's I, it called? I, it would immediately, like, uh, and and uh, but you have to give us uh, permission for like your camera, your microphone, <laughs> like all data. Uh, please leave this app on at all times, or we'll immediately delete all of your uh, cute dog photos. People would do it. Like uh, the 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 power of the meme wait in our modern world is amazing from from the visuals i'm seeing is ai portraits like you upload a photo and it makes a what looks like a painting portrait of, of your photo yeah in like a classical sort of uh portrait style so i don't know how well it works with multiple people but we i've found this image of the family here oh um, there you go i'm gonna upload <laughs> with, it, see what with, it with kepler doing a derp face oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so this is ai portraits.com it works well on the phone too i've had i've use this on the phone i always look bad in it i think it always draws me bad i don't know yeah um, no that's the portraits problem <laughs> so it, it, what they did is they put thousands and thousands of classical portraits in there and so the the ai built up a model of what a classic portrait looks like and then you have the input for a photo to say this is the way you start with the photo this is what you want to end up with so then what it does is it tries to basically create a portrait you know based upon that photo and and one of the things I want—I I made this point before, but most, almost all the, yeah, mine kind of looked like that too. <laughs> <laughs> most of the AI stuff we see right now uh, uses 2D images to sort of under, to like to create like 2D portraits and stuff because it doesn't understand it's looking at 3D objects, or whatever, only from what it can infer from that. But uh, as we start having more computing power and we start to increase that, is AI starts to process 3D images and 3D data sets and stuff, you're going to see scary, amazing things start to happen as it starts processing volumetric data. And, um, you know, and that's, you know, where a couple, you know, Moore's Law clicks away from that becoming a practical thing. But it's exciting. So, mm -hmm. all right, picks. Uh, uh, I got I got to pick. Uh, uh, it's it's literally 
anything but the Lion King. Um, uh, oh, fight, <laughs> fight, 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 the Lion King, go. <laughs> we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, on Cord Killers. Oh, but, it's boring but, time. Spoiler. No, spo- no, on this show. I don't it, listen to Cord Killers. <laughs> fight about it now. I mean, look, it's it's uh, uh, the problem with Christian Rock <laughs> is that it is apes the style of cutting edge art but mm-hmm. at its heart is so has so much respect for the core narrative that it dare not take an interesting artistic risk so as a result all christian rock songs are guess what spoiler alert hooray for god uh and uh that is what i felt during all of the lion king i hated it i hated it beyond words it was I- a deep fighting moment like, like you you, you dare not change and make anything interesting they mm-hmm. made Two very small changes. Billy Eichner and Seth Rogen were very, very fun and interesting. Sure. Uh, they were the only redeeming aspects of that entire garbage fire wow. of the movie. Uh, I started crying uh, halfway through the circle of life at the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> and then con- uh, continued to cry three more times in the film. T- t- today's opposite day. You're, you're, <laughs> you're taking the Brian role. <laughs> uh, I... I I, I think this is a marketing problem, honestly, for The Lion King. I think the fact that they kept putting out this clip of Hakuna Matata, which is this fun, cartoony song, when they kind of tried to do... We were talking about this before we turned the stream on, but uh, it, they kind of do a, like Meerkat Manor, right? Try to make a, a show out of just footage of animals. Right. And I think that's the aesthetic of this, right? It's trying to be realistic to try to get rid of all of the human sort of elements to it. And so that's why it's not like big expressive faces and and stuff like that. I, I will vouch for the fact that they succeeded in in making uh, an emotive narrative narrative come through not from facial expression expressions but from postural expressions, right? right? And and as a part of that, like you know, the, you the you notice the things that they changed, and the most of the things that they changed are things that they took out, right? So like, uh, be prepared is way shorter. It's like a minute long. Um, they like Rafiki, you know, I, I think like the, the whole scene of like Rafiki hitting Simba with the stick, like that doesn't even happen. Um, I, I, I think it's different, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I bought into the look of it. I don't think it's perfect. I think there are a lot of problems. I don't think that Donald Glover and Beyonce are great in their roles. And I also think it's okay. This is one very specific issue. Maybe you, maybe you see, we can, maybe we can meet eye to eye on this. Okay. I think it's very weird to put a new song in the movie that is sung by Beyonce, who does a character in the movie, in this movie where all the characters are singing, and it's not her character singing the song. Oh, I didn't I didn't even notice that. The, the new song Spirit, that when, when Simba is on his way back to Pride and he meets up with Nala, right. at the end of that scene, it's Beyonce singing that song. Who is Nala at that point? Did, didn't didn't track any of that. I thought I just thought it was like the weirdest decision to make, and I also missed the. Uh, uh, they call me Mr. Pig. That was I was really upset they didn't have a good replacement for that. But <laughs> otherwise, I thought it. I thought you know it was visually really impressive. I, a, a good film, not a massive. Felt like going good. to church. <laughs> I sat there. I've heard this sermon a million effing times before. Yeah. I couldn't wait for it to be over. Mm. Man, that wasn't as good of a fight. I want to draw the fight. <laughs> it's because we know we have to have it again we in two hours. This is, this is, pro- this is warm up. <laughs> this is undercard. You guys are just sparring with each other. <laughs> Cardkillers.com. You'll see that next, this week. Uh, this was my pick last week. It's my pick again this week because I watched a lot more of it. Euphoria on HBO. Uh, it is certainly teen exploitation, <laughs> like as in everything <laughs> that you've ever been warned about uh, that these teens are doing. Uh, it is all a plot line on this show, but uh, the cinematography is great, and it is uh, a, a real great example of a show that is constantly giving its characters something to do, things that matter, things that are interesting. And it, it's actually kind of made me think more and more about like the construct of why high school shows are always important like or, or are popular. We, we want to keep visiting uh, high school dynamics. Even if they are, you know, uh, cranked up to uh, a, a kind of beyond parody point, uh, which Euphoria kind of often is, but uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well done. It's certainly compared to some other shows that involve uh, teenagers that came out on Netflix that involve uh, other dimensions. Uh, 
you know, not to say that everything has to be about screwing and doing drugs like Euphoria is, but man, do they all have internal motivations that they seek to continue to resolve on an episode by episode basis. I think that's there's so many teen shows on Netflix. It took me about a minute to realize he meant Stranger Things. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, th- I mean, like, you know, sex education is another one that like is obviously, you know, a bunch of 27 year olds having sex and pretending that they're in high school. But uh, even that show was was a little bit it, it wore some of its like very special episode stuff on its sleeve in a way that mm-hmm. Euphoria doesn't, which is is interesting a in that it's like you can't be too much like what are we doing every time that you're trying to tell this kind of dirty or grittier story but uh uh it also it, it is always no matter what all the central points of every character are about relationships to other characters and not necessarily oh my god we're totally lost in this other weird sub thing mm-hmm uh, is Euphoria done? Is have they had their season finale yet? No, two more episodes. Two I more. just uh, I just checked today, and and for the record, I am up on everything but the episode that that aired last night. Last night, but uh, cool. yeah, well done. Uh, I have a pick beyond beyond the Lion King. Uh, over the weekend, I got into uh, into this new card game, and I was originally kind of pronounced he- hearthstone <laughs> heart hey, hearthstone when i was hesitant about it because i heard a lot of good stuff about it and i had, i did spend a little bit of time with hearthstone back in the back you know a few years ago mm-hmm. i was growing up i spent time with pokemon and Yu Gi Oh and magic and i think the thing that i don't like i don't like multiplayer games very much right like certainly not online multiplayer games and so um I think all of those card games, they're all multiplayer. Now Hearthstone is all online and stuff. And so I have a hard time keeping up with the competitive nature of those things. And so um, I have actually really found a good single player experience out of this new, not new, it's like six months old. Uh, this game Slay the Spire. And mm. it is a roguelike um, uh, card game. And so a little similar to like a, the arena mode in Hearthstone, you pick one of these three heroes and as you make your way up this tower, uh, each floor is usually like a, a there's either a card battle or sometimes you'll have a little like a adventure game like choice or you'll go to a, a shop or you have to rest or something. And um, as you go with your run, you have a certain deck that you start off with of a few cards and each each battle you gain more cards. And I think I, you know, I, I actually finally beat it over the weekend and it was like an hour or an half or so for the run, the full run. And it was really interesting because it lets you like the thing with Hearthstone is, you know, you can do combos and you can really build your deck to do certain things. And with this, because you're constantly remaking the deck and you are so well used to, you know, a pool of like 70 cards or so per character, um, you can do some really crazy stuff. So like there's there are relics that give you like buffs and do weird stuff and there was this one that I got that gives you confusion for uh, just you will always have confusion but there's this you get an extra energy or something and confusion randomizes all of the card values so you can just do whatever in your deck because you're not know, gonna know what the, what anything costs and so it lets you do weird make weird choices like that I I really enjoyed. It. it's it's very cool i i think you would like it Brian, cool and, and, and it's called what it's called slay the spire it's slay on Slay the spire uh, it's on the nintendo switches which where i'm playing it but it's also on pc and a bunch of other places it's I, I think it's it's really cool and as someone who likes those card games but doesn't like spending time to get another person involved to play sure uh i think it's really cool very cool what about you andrew so I uh, I have some interviews coming up this week that I got to do for the Shark Week thing, and and you know, and talk about like ah, I did this thing, and they have granted. I mean, the, the you know clip package where you're with great white sharks is kind of an awesome clip package to happen. I'll, I'll have, but I, I decided I was going to make a uh, an experience, and one just one to sort of show people when I do interviews, like hey, this is what it's like. Um, what it's like to be with great white sharks is one of the things that I was taught was with great whites is they can see when you're looking at them. And when you're down there, you got to keep eye contact with, you know, like I had like a dozen at a time and you got to look around and see each one and let each one know that you see them and they keep away when they don't think you're paying attention is when they come up behind you and they're, they're ambush hunters, ambush predators. 
And there were multiple occasions where I had sharks sneaking up behind me because they didn't think I was paying attention and I had to turn around really fast um, and, and, you know, give them a stern, go away, shark uh, uh, <laughs> version underwater that you do. But anyhow, mm -hmm. um, so I, I went and I used a framework called A-Frame, which is a web VR framework for the browser. And I made an experience that works in the Oculus Quest. It works in VR. And if you go to actually ghostdiver.xyz, you can see this, and there's a video playing of this. And so what it is is you're underwater, and when you have your controllers, your right hand is a shield, and your left hand has a flashlight. So if you go into night mode, um, you can try to spot the great whites before they sneak up on you. Uh, probably best in day mode. Um, night mode has been... Some people describe it as very triggering and terrifying, <laughs> myself included. looking at this video, it's total darkness. It's insane. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, you 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 can go to there. If you look in your browser, you'll see what it looks like during day mode, and you don't really, you're not going to be able to control or protect yourself because you need the controllers to sort of raise the shield. But that shark, I, I built a very simple, uh, not even AI, just a very simple uh, kind of like uh, logic for the sharks that was similar to how they behave. Now, granted, <laughs> sharks can also surprise you and do things that all of a sudden they decide they're going to behave differently. So hmm. um, you go there and you can, with the controllers inside, like your Oculus or your Vive or whatever, you click on one button, it'll start to add sharks. You click on another button, which is the uh, O blank mode, where it'll remove sharks. <laughs> and then if you get really brave, you click night mode, and all you have is a flashlight, <gasps> and the shark is going to come see you and ah, say hello. Oh, they got us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's even better. He didn't eat you. He just passed you. He just sort of violated your space. But when he eats you, it's really fun. And I put some sound effects and stuff in there from like Jaws and stuff. And <laughs> you get like, like a doll's eye. He's <laughs> just some Quint stuff in there. So um, personally speaking, I find it terrifying. <laughs> I find this can be, this is more frightening to me than my actual experience with Grey Whites. <laughs> so that is ghostdiver.xyz. Yeah, free, if you have a Quest or you have an Oculus Rift or Vive, whatever, it should work. I think it should work on those other, I know it tested on the Quest, but, uh, you know, I built that as sort of a fun, and kind of a cool thing, it's just a showcase for the technology, like, it only took me like two days to put together a fun, terrifying experience using, you know, this this framework A-frame and a little bit of JavaScript. Nice. And yeah. some cool models and stuff by other people, which are credited in the notes there, so. Ghost Diver to XYZ. There's a video there. I should put up some more videos, but anyhow, um, I need to get the, uh, you know, having you or Brian playing that and recording yourselves. That's what I want the video. So cool. Uh, guess that's all. Guess it's everything. Guess it's been weird. Yeah, there we go. Oh, crap. I forgot to say, Bryce, check your email. Oh, sure. I did a little AI portrait. Oh, absolutely. Kind of like, oh, no. And you guys would enjoy seeing. AI portrait. Oh, this is great. Oh, oh that's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's like the painting of Jesus that's been retouched. You know, the, 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 the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> This actually looks good. You came out well. It's pretty good. I know. Yeah, look at that. I always look like a, one of those middle of the family bush uh royal <laughs> royals <laughs> in mine <laughs> that's like like that's like da vinci's forgotten assistant justinius you know who like uh you know went off to become a town order or something you know and, and just something there's a story behind that and i want to know it yeah, there's something something horrifying went on with that that i'm gonna bloke. put that in the discord yeah. so we don't lose that uh, uh, do you guys need a break? Yeah, yeah. Give me one yeah, second. Right. I think kid stuff is happening. Go take a break. Alrighty, let's go to Spotify. Here we go. Hey, Juice. Uh, right. The one thing that uh, uh, you missed in San Diego was uh, I think both of Brian's children got the lesson that uh, the the most fun that happens at the con is not at the con oh it's... yeah yeah yeah. so uh we had we totally I... we just shut down uh, a a gas lamp uh pub playing space team <laughs> uh that's me, great Brian, teasdale <laughs> penny josie and uh katie dirks the 
honorable mention for San Diego uh, Comic Con Film Festival for their mm-hmm. film This Is Wrestling. Uh, but yeah, it was loud. Like we were like yelling, and and it's space team, so you're just yelling the most ridiculous things at each other. Uh, but very very fun. Space team's great because you can just kind of do that wherever. Um, yeah. Because I we did that during Big Diz, right? We like took a break and oh, just it. No, I think we shut down Italy. <laughs> we all sat down and just rocked rocked Italy for a solid couple uh mm-hmm. solid couple rounds of space team. Yeah. We were, we were we were trying to figure out the best strategy on whether or not like we tried a few versions of like either you go around the circle and everybody is like just yelling kind of like oh, everyone gets one command down the yeah. line. Huh. And then we did a like everybody one person yells and then the person that solves for that then yells theirs. Oh. Uh so basically you're just assuring theoretically that you are that you are not just yelling repeatedly and everybody else is just thinking about yelling their own thing but rather at the very least you're getting like all right this is you know getting solved and then the next person but that that kind of uh no matter what once you get into the later rounds it's it's all chaos especially with especially if you have a ton of people you know that, that that gets tough too. Yeah, we had six, but but then again, I guess that's that's the, the the key though is you really just do need to balance between the 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 total chaos of just everybody screaming mm-hmm. uh, and everybody kind of understanding at least taking that moment to look at what they have to solve and be like, oh, yeah. that's why this person keeps yelling over and over again. Did uh, uh, did you guys end up doing Star Wars? Was that uh, it? Was... No, no, oh, no, no. I I was in and out. I, I I was in on Thursday. Did the the documentary screening and then did a, a Quizitron at HopCon, which was the Stone Brewing uh, little like mini event that they do. And then uh, yeah, I was back on Friday. I literally the the the, the cool thing to do was literally just uh, playing space team with uh, everybody at, at the, the Dubliner. That's and then great. I just got on a plane and came home. Pretty great. Not going to lie. It was fun. It was a blast. All right. Here. BRB. Yeah, go for it. Uh, did, did you guys go to Star Wars or uh, Disney? Mm, oh, uh, sorry. Or was that was that a... D- Disneyland was at VidCon? Oh, okay. Uh, and, I don't know we... where California is. Got it. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, Anaheim is southish of LA, and then way southish is uh, San Diego. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, San Diego, we did go to the beach. That was fun, hmm. and uh, went to this awesome little boardwalk. And uh, uh, kids had a great time. Their first ever Comic Con. That's great. Penny's first con experience. Did she, she get to see a bunch of? I know she wanted to see a bunch of stuff. Did she yeah. get to see enough stuff that was like, uh, like I probably like I don't think she would have got to see everything realistically. But did she get to see enough stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Like, good. like the experience was fantastic all the way around. Good, and good, and good. keep in mind, part of it is just the novelty of going and visiting family and staying with with our uh, aunt and uncle. Um, mm-hmm. uh, she got to go like three times to the expo floor, or whatever. Mm. Um, all of the panels that they did. At that age, it's hard to be into panels because it's a bunch of just sit people down sitting around like and talking, you yeah. know. So, um, but uh, but it was great. It was a That's fantastic great. experience. Awesome. Uh, they were super well behaved. I saw Bonnie was made like a big co- or made the face mask for her cosplay costume. Yeah, and she then definitely uh, Penny lost, definitely maybe. lost it there. Oh. Yeah, uh, it's a tribute. She, she 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 delivered tribute to the con. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure this is a controversial co- uh, 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 topic in in the household, but uh, how did she even lose the mask? <laughs> the, the, the mask is is hard to lose. I mean, uh, if if you saw her face in that expo center, like she was very lost in the yeah. immensity of everything going on. Like yeah. like it's it's very obvious to me how she lost it. Like she, like she was not in the moment, not you know keeping track of you know where her stuff was she was lost in the experience and so yeah. with that regard of of course she would lose it you know i mean that being said i've lost so much in fact i was once on a flight with andrew that i lost my boarding pass between like, getting it and like getting to the front uh, like getting to the point where uh, uh we needed it and this was a, a world pre-app 
uh, mm. where like now at least I have it on my phone because I know I'm not going to lose my phone. But so uh, I have I have certainly lost plenty of stuff. So I, I I should not be casting any aspersions. Oh, I've I've gotten up out of airplane seats and like Rosh is like you left your iPad sitting <laughs> in the pocket. I so. definitely left my iPad on a plane. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I definitely I, lost. I lost my earbud, AirPod rather, <gasps> once on the way there to Comic Con, which is something that has never happened to me before, and I'm shocked has not happened before, where I accidentally just like knocked it out, but it was as we were descending. And so it just went tumbling forward down the aisle uh, and luckily caught some lady's backpack strap. So I knew where it was to go pick it up. But then on the way back, fell asleep and just gone. Just one out of there, <clears throat> not the seat, not under the seat in front of me, not under the seat behind me. And I'm like, lost lost to history I, I have no other way to even try to find it if man what's funny not, we we yeah. talked about this on the flight back um uh josie was watching the office so so i split my raycon earbuds and so we're watching and then you know josie's ears are smaller or whatever so it just popped out of her ear and i watched it go don't don't do room and then i and and suddenly i just thought of our conversation and at this exact moment they go, bing, we're beginning our final descent. And uh, I was just like, eat shit, everyone. <laughs> and I turn on the the, the, the the flashlight and I pull on, yep. just splayed out and, and look mm -hmm. down. I was like, I was like, not today, Satan. <laughs> no, I, I did exactly that. And I'm like tearing up my, my seat to make sure that it's not below or in one of the crevices and there was nothing. And I was just like, well, that's just going to be a $60 trip to the Apple store. Yeah, oh, man. You know, just glue them in. And you know what story we forgot to get to? Hmm. Neuralink. Maybe the biggest of last week. Neuralink. Neuralink. Ooh. Yeah. I kind of no, thought we you were going to get to that with the AI because that's part of Neuralink, right? Is yeah, yeah. We definitely have to let, let let's let's make sure that we pencil that in for next week because yeah. I think that that deserves a longer talk. Yeah. All uh, right. You ready? Yeah. Ready, ready. Uh, you have a topic for? Afternoons? Yeah, I, I think we have a topic. Okay, great. Well, then, uh, if you're good, then take it away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. So, uh, you know, After Things, we talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, <laughs> we give career advice, which, you know, is Shocking. kind of fun. Marginal. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny by itself. We talk about pop culture, entertainment, and I think we could do a pop culture thing. Anything big happened last couple of days? Any announcements in the pop culture world? I mean, I, I, hey, uh, live on the scene, it's gumshoe reporter Brian Brushwood uh, just returning back from Comic-Con. Name one where, other Brian? person Wait, who's where, a co-host of this podcast that, that, that was there at Comic-Con. The comic what? Comic Con, uh, Andrew. It's a it's a, a fun little festival they have down there in San Diego town, and they uh, get all these nerds together, and they uh, mostly look at each other and buy figurines. It's a Funko Pop enthusiast festival that they also uh, uh, do commercials for upcoming movies. Two on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is amazing how Comic Con has. You know, it used to be like. I don't know, it was like Cine West, Show West or whatever was like yeah. the big, big deal where they would announce upcoming movies because that's where all the theater owners would go. And that was sort of like the big place where you would get that. And Comic-Con has become like the Comdex of entertainment, if there was still a Comdex. Um, you know, it is an amazing how much comes out of there now and how that is. So uh, uh, highlights? Anybody? Anything cool? Uh, yeah, man. Um, there was an amazing game of space team that was played at the Dubliner uh, just north of the, the uh, oh, convention tell me more. Uh, well, I think, look, the big, the big news was uh, Marvel returns to San Diego Comic-Con. They lay out phase four. Uh, and it, it's fairly remarkable in that they, they really made it half about showing the kind of, uh, of talent they were going to bring to Disney plus, which I would have almost suspected would be more, of like a D23 thing, but uh, they did it at Comic-Con and it was star-studded. In a lot of ways, it kind of felt like a, a a big 
a, a, a big kind of a, a victory lap for them in, in saying like, look, we already just made that the, the announcement began with them saying that they had officially passed uh, Avatar as the most uh, money making movie of all time. And then uh, they proceed- barely okay. with a little bit of goosing, but that's that, not to take anything away from that. That whole thing felt like, oh, yeah, we just found seven million dollars somewhere. Yeah, I actually read I read a couple things uh, about apparently like that is a thing that happens when the movies are like officially coming out of theaters and they do their final accounting on it. Mm-hmm. But who knows? It's Hollywood accounting. But 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 also I think I think the important thing is I I, I don't want to take anything away from you know the Avengers franchise or anything but uh, it, it is telling that this year has just been soft for blockbusters all around like if you can't beat Avatar and a, a movie that 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 generally rode the public interest in 3D technology to to see uh, if you can't beat Avatar with the culmination of a ten year saga. Uh, I, I I don't know. It was softer. Like it should have beat I, Avatar much much faster. I don't I don't know. I mean, because like Avatar had such a perfect storm of events that happened. More people went to the box office back then. Correct. Yeah. Fewer people go see movies now, and that's the hard part. Is that in ticket prices have gone up, and partially is to account for that. But if you look at raw numbers of ticket sales, that's the problem the industry is facing. Is that we're just not going to the movies like we used to. And, and the fact that you could beat Avatar, I was more impressed by that. That you know, and that's why it had to be worldwide because domestically, you know, they tried to goose it with the re the re release of it, and it was such a botched. Jeff. Yeah, you know, I think uh, they could have done it domestically if they uh, did it right. Uh, uh, keep in mind, my comments are an indictment on the state of the box office, not an indictment on the like Avengers full on earned. The right yeah. to be the number one movie of all time. Like, like, uh, uh, I am mad that it didn't happen faster. Uh, if anything, yeah, no, I, I get you. That's a good shit. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, look at go pull up Box Office Mojo and look at like the list of top movies. You know, for the year. You know, the top the top movies so far. And if I'm not mistaken, it's like they're all either Disney owned or Marvel produced. You know, because like Spider Man. Is not owned by Disney. It's Sony, but it's Avengers, produced. Yeah, like, Captain it's Marvel, five, Toy five. Story, Aladdin, Spider Man, The Lion King. Oh my God! I just want to vomit. Us at seven. John Wick wow. at eight. How to Train Your Dragon at nine. Life of Pets at ten. But still, top <laughs> top six out of t- the top ten. Yeah, and again, Spider Man is technically a Sony movie, but it was oh, sure. made by sure, yeah, sure. Marvel. Yeah, it it yeah. is a Marvel movie. Um, so laid out Phase Four. I do think it's funny because now they're having this conversation, it does kind of make sense that they're like, oh, and look at all the cool things that will not be dependent on box office grosses <laughs> that are going to be on this over the top streaming service. But uh, uh, let's let's take a look at what they they laid out. The first movie coming out is the long awaited Black Widow movie. That'll be May 1st, 2020. Are we excited about Black Widow. Yes, she was the one of the very best parts of Endgame. She was amazing, and I look forward to it. Apparently, I'm uh, the only one. I, I will, that's I, fine. That's fine. Let's just uh, no, let no, that no, awkward silence clarify. hang. When we get closer to it, I will be. I, I, I think I love Scarlett Johansson as an actress. I think that my my issue has been the backstory we got in Ultron and some of that and stuff just made me less interested in it. But I think that I will be super psyched and stoked for it by the time we get closer to it what? because Marvel always surprises and delights me. It, as as a concept right now, no, because it's like I think Ultron and what they did there, and I think that some of the stuff just made me. And I I had issue. I mean, like Endgame's amazing, but I. I I felt like, man, like she's so much more interesting than what they're doing, and I will. I'll get I think there. I'm I'll writing. I think I'm writing on the wave of her being far and away. And again, this is reductionist and 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 rude of me, but but in the category of female superheroes, far and away the most interesting person in Infinity War and Endgame put together. Far and away, and and every moment they try to wedge somebody who wasn't uh, Black Widow, I got mad. I'm like, why are you not showing Black Widow? Uh, so the idea of of getting 
getting a little bit of room to really see her sing I, I'm excited about. I'm, I, I'm looking forward to the first female-led Marvel movie. <laughs> it sounds like you refuse to acknowledge a certain other movie, but that's fine. <laughs> I can't remember. Hey, if anybody can name another one, let me know, but I can't remember another one. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, and Brian, I'd say the point is, it, you know, that your point kind of rings up like, yeah, you know, let's get more female characters out there. So it's, you know, it's not easy just to pick and go, well, this one's great because it's like, yeah, of you know, the three, you know, but um, I'm ex I mean, again, I know I'm going to be surprised and delight. Like I went to like Dr. Strange. I'm like, Oh, I love Dr. Strange. And like, I don't, I don't like this take from this trailer. And now I'm like, ah, it's one of my favorite Marvel movies. Ah, you know, I'm that guy. I, I'm very easily flipped. I'm very easily swayed. So I'm like, my hands on my head's going, mm, I don't know, Marvel. And then I'm going to be like, you know, you're going to see me here probably in these microphones going, ah, oh, I go see you know, I Widow. mean, re reminder that she was uh, essentially the other half of the Winter Soldier, one of the best Marvel movies, full stop. Well, that, that was apparently the, the uh, footage that was shown, uh, it was described as Winter Soldier slash like John Wick kind of esque that they, that so, they want to tell a. a here I, hear, you know what, I, I just think I put my finger on what it is that sort of got me is that like we've had a lot of okay kind of like there's been atomic blonde there's been yeah. like red there's been a lot of stuff that I haven't seen any of this footage there's been a lot of stuff that we've already had that sounds like it and that when you do the female spy thing it almost always follows the same exact template of she comes from the spy agency that now betrayed her and she's got to find out who d who's behind it and that sort of is like my bias going into it it's like I've seen the same female spy story now done every effing time I can think of like probably a dozen female spy movies that all feel like that I have faith that Marvel's going to give me something fresh and different that's my confidence because mm -hmm. And she's even done that movie, you know? So that's, that's everything I've heard about it sounds like that movie. And it's like, man, you know, I'm no about me, but I write a lot of female characters. And I try to make them complex and find different sort of storylines. And I get kind of bored when I'm like, oh, you're using plot A. Okay. But it's yeah. Marvel. That's it's like, oh, let me guess. It's a female spy movie. Is she going to wear a sexy dress and then like uh, uh, kiss a lady or a gross dude? And uh, then she has she's to pretend gonna... to be somebody and get in the uh, seductive. Use her thighs to, you know, bring a guy down, which, you know, in judo, that's what we all we taught. All we taught, yeah. you know, you know, the women gonna... in the class is like, this is how you take a guy down is just throw your thighs around his head. And do... <laughs> it's like... gotta be a... Is there going to be a moment where she's going to look uh, to the camera and take off her wig, wig. And, and, you know, walk forward? I'll bet you that's in the movie. Have you seen the Charlie's Angels trailer, by the way? No. Is there like <laughs> another Charlie's Angels? <laughs> yeah, they're bringing it back. It. Oh, oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no, no. I did see it. Yeah. No. And that the fact that I couldn't remember it is probably my commentary. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, Bryce, uh, 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 the next... Uh, next one on the list is uh, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming to Disney+. Plus. This one, this one is actually, uh, it'll be interesting to hear if I'm on the other side of this. This one, I'm less uh, knee-jerk excited about. Uh, I like the Falcon. I like the Winter Soldier. Don't love either of them. Uh, we'll see if they can combine together to form an interesting character. I'm going to tell you here, this is the Thor for Marvel. In the th meaning that... Thor was the big test of, hey, can we bring in like gods and other dimensions and all this magical into a world where you had Iron Man is a he's, in, he's Elon Musk who builds a suit, you know, Iron, you know, Captain America, yeah, it's a little bit of biotechy kind of thing, but it's you know, yeah, this guy takes off his face and he's a red skull, but it didn't stretch. We didn't have to think like go way beyond, and that was the big bold leap for Thor was, no, we're literally going to have a rainbow bridge, we're literally going to have that, and. That movie, you know, it's not it, it's not ranked among many people's favorite Marvel movies, but the weight it had to carry in the universe that it built is sort of the, the shoulders upon which Marvel sort of now stands, right? Um, this, you getting Marvel, the theatrical unit now, the MC, people really respond for the MCU getting into TV. We've seen the other TV projects done were basically ABC projects with Marvel partially but really were not wasn't the same core some of the same like well joss we this but yeah but it wasn't an mcu project it was a different writing team different people planning this this is coming from top so this is a very different approach so marvel trying to do a live action television series 
And again, people are like, well, there was shield. Like that was different division, different people. Yeah. And the results speak for themselves, depending upon your point of view on that. The, the Netflix stuff was good, but that was still, all right, go off, do this. This is going to be interesting because these are main MCU characters. These are people that are going to go back into the movies. These are storylines that are going to affect that. And the quality has to be there. Look what happened with, you know, over time, like with, uh, you know, the, the Netflix stuff, like by the time you got to Iron Fist, you know. I, I Iron Fist killed my interest in all of it. Like, and I loved, uh, uh, I loved Daredevil. I thought Jessica Jones was great. I really dug the first six episodes of uh, uh, Luke, Luke Cage. Cage. And uh, uh, when one character died, apparently to be reborn as Blade, uh, I lost a lot of interest in in that series. Uh, but as soon as Iron Fist happened, I was like, oh, but I I could not care less. This guy sucks. This story sucks. And and it never really came back for me. And that was, you know, and then there was, you know, with things we, cause like Marvel TV gave us the immortals. Yeah, mm -hmm. which, you know, well, uh, and also in comical farts out. Also, you know, this was earlier this year, but Hulu kind of picked up the Marvel TV deal for these animated series. And yeah. now this is Marvel making the live action stuff move over to Disney Plus. And so Hulu is kind of this. I think Hulu is going to be where the offbeat weird stuff is, because that'll be yeah. like Howard the Duck. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I I'm curious because and I guess they come back. to This is what what Falcon and Winter Soldier uh is or whatever the title is captain america or what's it called again? Uh, falcon falcon and the winter soldier yeah. will start but yeah if he's captain america i'm confused uh what this is going to give us is we're going to see the largest entertainment company on the planet telling us this is the future of entertainment box office will be there but also that we want to give you a reason to give us every month, give us this Marvel, this Marvel subscription money, that, and then Star Wars with Mandalorian. Uh, it's high stakes. It's very, very, very high stakes on this because you see how big like Stranger Things become or how big Game of Thrones became. Disney is now outside of their children's content. I don't think they've ever had a series kind of thing that's become that. Yeah, you know. And so I guess that's the behind the scenes weight on this. Uh, and, and also, I, I will say, you know, they tease Baron Zemo as well, what we are, are, assume is going to be the season one villain. Uh, I thought uh, he was awesome. Daniel Bruhl uh, played a great Zemo in uh, Civil War. I, I thought that Civil War for me was the first time that Marvel kind of the, the MCU took a very marked difference of like, we're going to really put the weight into our villains. We're going to make our villains complex and and not just uh, a thing that our heroes will punch at the end uh and so i'm i'm excited i think that you can tell a more you can tell a very interesting baron zemo story based on the character that was introduced in civil war over you know six or eight episodes wherever they're gonna do man you know? now, now you just reminded me of how bad the actual villain of Civil War was like Baron so Zemo. Bad. They don't explain him so, at all. So they bad that none awful. of us can remember his name. We just remember he was the dude that tried to kill himself and got stopped from killing himself at the end. Hey, mm -hmm. no, I just said he was good. I just explained. Oh, Baron no, 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 no. no. Baron it. Zemo was not was not the villain in that in was... Civil War. Uh, uh, you got to the end. It was it was that that dude in his late thirties who tried to kill himself. Uh, he was the one behind everything. Baron oh, Zemo that, was long that's dead Baron and Zemo. gone. That's Baron Zemo. What? You're thinking of Doctor Zola. Sorry, yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. Doctor Zola. I was thinking of Ultron. So. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, Ultron. Baron Zemo. Okay. Yeah. Shoot, I gotta go back and watch that movie. I guess I don't know. A great movie. <laughs> the. Uh... Doctor Zola. Said... Wow. Sorry. Wow. What? Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, the next item on the Phase Four coming November 6, twenty twenty is The Eternals with Kumail Nanjiani, Laurel, Lauren Ridloff, Brian Tyree Henry, Selma Hayek, Liam McHugh, Don Lee, Angelina Jolie, uh, directed by Chloe Zhao. I, I don't know how you make this What land. is The Eternals? I mean, uh, it's, it's just everything writ large, right? It's like, uh, keep making, like, th this is where I think 
I worry, and this is all fan talk. This is not uh, anybody judging the artistic ability of anybody else, but you begin with Iron Man, a very grounded, very concrete story that gets a little bit high tech and more high tech and more high tech. Then you expand, expand guardians of the galaxy. I thought, or actually Thor was the first time that I thought that was the threshold and you can't cross it cause it'll get too silly and too big. And then again, guardians of the galaxy, I thought would be the threshold because the characters are too minor and the, 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 the stakes too cosmic. And now uh, to be honest, if you told me on paper, I would have said the same thing about Endgame and infinity war. And this is the next threshold where I am tempted to say, okay, we get it. We're getting even bigger. Uh, and, and I will say flatly that they failed to cross that threshold with Captain Marvel. Too much power, totally lost interest. Everything's cosmic mm -hmm. light show and infinite whatevers. Um, Eternals, I fear the same thing. I fear that we're, we're dealing with too big of a story to, for me to really perceive them as human beings that I care about. I, I've, my, my <laughs> issue with Captain Marvel is I, I agree the power thing. It's the Superman problem when you make them too powerful. And it's like they had this with Quicksilver. You saw this both with the Fox's version of, of Quicksilver and Marvel's version of him where it's like, oh, man, this guy goes really effing fast and can solve these problems very quickly. We either have to write him out of the story quickly or kill him off. You know, that was a problem with Captain Marvel. Was that, is it like, you know, like, oh, no, she's unavailable. Can't get here because it's like, yeah, um, that's one problem. The other is we could talk about story. I do have faith in Marvel in that, like, they chose this for a reason because they go, what stories do we want to do? And, and, you know, Justin and I have argued now over, hey, which is the better Spider-Man movie now, Far From Home yeah. or Homecoming? You know, when we're arguing over of these two Spider-Man, which is the better and which is one of the best Marvel movies ever, you know, their ability to go from Thor Ragnarok to getting me excited about kids on a field trip in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like I said, it's like I'm like ah oh, Black Widow, been there, seen it, and then I'm gonna be like, oh my god, it's amazing, you know, and like and and, and to 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 be clear, I'm not in the business of betting against Disney. I mean, they're they're, they're fantastic stewards well, of the well, franchise. I, I, there's some Disney we can bet against, but uh, um, but 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 my my point is is yet again, I find myself at a very familiar crossroads where everything about the nature of this project screams maybe maybe too much, maybe too big of scope for me to get invested in can, like at, at least in a descriptive way are they are they all superheroes are they gods or like they, they, i don't they're, I, they're cosmic superheroes right so so think okay. in in the realm of of, of captain, captain marvel. marvel yeah okay got it that's yeah okay uh, i there's two movies on this slate and i'm sure we'll get to the next one right after this that i have the same feelings of which are like uh you guys have built up a lot of goodwill so i'll <laughs> Definitely go see it, but mm -hmm. man, do I not immediately have any interest in either the Eternals. I think that that's a fun cast well, with, with the Eternals. I do like everybody that is in that uh, uh, that movie, but this and the, the, the Ten Rings film, I'm like, mm, man, do I not immediately have any interest in, in either of these properties. Uh, as, so here's, yeah. here's, you know, here's a take, though, is that, like, Marvel and really with Kevin Feig, they do things. Feig, they do things from a very smart point of view. They come there and they say either we need to do this because often it's financially. You know, uh, a Shang Chi movie is like, hey, what's our second biggest market? China. What's one of our issues? Diversity. Great fit. Great, great, great fit. Let's go do this and let's make the best movie we can because it solves two issues: both where we want to be artistically and trying to be more representative. And then where we want to be financially with trying to address a global world market. But, you know, Marvel, it's not like Marvel sitting there with, you know, is it like 80 years now from timely comics on forward of history of going, man, I just don't have any more ideas. No, they have too many. So they need to choose carefully pick and choose. And so even things I haven't like been big fans of, I get why they've done. And they've certainly an, another audience has found them and loved it. 
you know, that's been my thing. That you know, a couple of my my least favorite Marvel movies, you know, have been ones that other people have loved, and I go like, well, they know what they're doing. And here it's like, like I'm kind of like, it's not like they just sort of, you know, Kevin Feige just reached into a stack of comic books and just pulled out, ah, Eternals. What's this? Here, make it happen, and threw them, you know, threw the comic at them, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming. Well, that would be cool, though. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm assuming that based on the MCU and and their track record that they have a good story here and then and they and they want to tell it. Uh, this will apparently show us the real Mandarin, not the version that we saw in Iron Man three, which I loved. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad you said that because to be honest, I was like, man, I kind of like the how they handled the Mandarin thing. Kind of not mm-hmm. thrilled to see them undo or 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 I, have the real one or whatever. I would say, look, I think that you can do cool things with what the Mandarin is supposed to be in in the comics. I think it fits a lot better in a movie where all the characters are Asian and not when it's being played by Ben Kingsley in a in in on a, an Iron Man movie, uh, but. At the same time, Mandarin is a problematic character in general, so I was happy to see them zag instead of try to shoehorn it into uh, the MCU. But yeah, uh, look, um, this is one of those where congratulations, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll buy this too. I'll, I'll buy into this. Cool, let's go. Uh, so that was. Yeah. Uh, oh no, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was Shang Chi. That's in February. Uh, in spring of 2021 is WandaVision, uh, with uh, Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany back as uh, Scarlet Witch and Vision. Also, an adult Monica Rambeau, who was in Captain Marvel. This is Disney mm. Plus. For her. Yeah. Um. I. I'm. You know. I think in the comics, you know that that the play between those two has been great. They've had a lot of fun with that, and I think that you could really get into sort of fun personal stories and stuff. And you know, I just, I'm just the thing that I think it's that that does concern me about the Marvel movies, the upcoming slate, and other than the one next one we're getting to, I have never seen anything by any of the directors that are directing them. Right? I've never seen anything by any of these directors, so I have no compass. I have no way to go like, oh, they did a really cool job here, and I'm excited about the director. Because I'm ignorant. I just don't see enough movies and stuff. And I think that was part of the thing that kind of got to me, though, was the, like, I trust the Marvel machine, you know, but, like, the my favorite Marvel movies have been from directors that have done really cool stuff before. Or I go, oh, they're good at this, they're good at that. And I guess that's what scares me. That's what scares me about most about Phase 4 is they're expanding the, the directors, which is I think is a great thing, but none of them have done anything that I, I go, oh, this is cool, I'm excited to see where they go. Well, especially in a post uh, Netflix MCU universe where we've seen missteps, we've seen what it looks like when when somebody doesn't do a good story, and we watched we watched the Defenders uh, franchise collapse in on itself. Well, I would see. I think in just for the movies point of view, like from the the TV series stuff, like that it ends up being so much more committee at this level. Yeah. Well, and, and but, I believe, uh, uh, Bryce, you said WandaVision was a, a TV show. Yeah, or? this will be a Disney Plus. Yeah. Series. Yeah, I know. It's going back to the movies. I'm sorry. I was my, my, my delayed thought. But yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, WandaVision, like I said, for the, that, that could be a fun show. I mean, that could be a very fun, you know, the, the, that relationship between those two, I thought was, you know, my girlfriend had never seen, she saw like the, the first Marvel movie. And one of the first ones she saw, I think, was Infinity War. And she, yeah, one of, the first was that in the relationship between her first introduction to Wanda and vision was there, but thought it was very strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so that is there uh, uh, and that will feed directly into, cause uh, although they do have some first time directors at the beginning of phase four, they anchoring it with some returning directors. And the first of which is Scott Derrickson with uh, Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness, which uh, 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 Scarlet, Witch will feed directly into from the Wanda vision series but this apparently will be i think they went out of their way to say to not say the h word (laughs) i didn't hear them say horror they said it's going to be the first scary mcu movie uh but i'm in i'm in on that like yeah give me give me a a, a real like dr strange has some real macabre you know kind of stuff in it and i think that especially in the hands of scott derrickson and, and c robert cargill you can tell a great great 
Doctor Strange movie. Well, of and, and all of them, this might be the one I'm most excited it's for. It's not it's it's not much of a stretch at all. Uh, they were already dipping their toes in Lovecraftian waters, so I would imagine that that will get you know a number of things that feel like H.P. Lovecraft out of this. I'm I'm stoked. You know, I I think that the lesson of Thor Ragnarok was take a thing you love, put them into an environment that's very very different for them and different from what we've seen them before, and you know we're we're watching them push more towards like you know when they first started to try to imagine that you know we you know that we were going to get to where marvel ended up you know imagine trying to describe you know in game to somebody 20 years ago sure or, or 15 years ago describing like oh yeah i'm gonna tell you the biggest box office movie of all time what's it gonna be well, half the Avengers are going to be, you know, vanish because Thanos did the snap. And so they're going to have to go do this. And like, yeah, in your dreams. Yeah, that'll happen. That'll be the biggest movie ever. Right. Some Avengers movie based upon, the, you know, the Infinity Gauntlet. You know, that's going to happen. Well, guess what? That's the world <laughs> yeah. we live in now. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that if somebody somebody can go back and, and find some uh, uh, AICN talk back comment, you know, from 1997, where it's like, you know, it would be the biggest thing ever. It just lays out all of it, only to be summarily trashed by everybody. Else. I was like, well, nobody else the Avengers are. You'd have to establish them first with a series of movies. <laughs> but I doubt that'll happen. But, you know, you'd really need like Disney to buy Marvel and for them yeah. to, you know. In your dreams, K. Faggy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. uh, but yeah, no, I think this is awesome. This is this is uh, uh, the, the the one of all the movies that in Phase Four. I think this is the one where I would bet the most money it will it will knock it out of the park. So, Doctor Strange's May 2021, also in spring of 2021, is a new Disney Plus series, Loki, uh, starring Tom Hiddleston as Loki. This seems like it could be extraordinarily fun. Like uh, mm -hmm. anytime you have a villain that that you are Can given a framework that you're allowed to kind of root for, especially, I mean, he's the god of mischief, right? And uh, so it's sort of anything goes. It, it, it feels to me like this is a rich tapestry. And of course, Tom Hiddleston is a tremendous talent. And uh, I, I'm very excited about it. In fact, possibly out of everything, I'm most excited about this. Th wow. This seems the most episodic. Like you can just say, all right, so Loki's in World War Two, Loki's in the French Revolution. Exactly, Loki's like like it's sliders in the MCU, right? Yeah. Uh, MCU sliders, that'd be great. Cool. Let's you know everything is is kind of uh, uh, we can just tell a fun story with this character where the weight of everything well, is on. Plus, it, also it, it, the same way that Falcon and Winter Soldier it is, and WandaVision it is, because these are going to tie right back into these other movies. Loki's like, whatever, he's in kind of a pocket universe and he's going to destroy, like, we don't know whether or not he's going to pervert this entire thing well, or not. And that's the nice thing is that he doesn't have an overt mandate to do the right thing. You know, it's like, set us up with a situation and uh, how would a sociopath with infinite power deal with it? <laughs> Let's find out. Yeah, and he's still in another universe, right? So it's going to be... yeah. Fun to see what happens there because then it's you don't have to play by the yeah, same rules. Officially, and... our Loki is still dead, but yeah. but side uh, our our neighbor universe he uh, ran off with the tesseract. Oh weird. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, it's interesting because now that Marvel's got a gazillion movies in, and and like I said, you know, the last Marvel movie, like if you go look at the Rotten Tomatoes for Far From Home, and it's actually, I think, currently like the highest from an audience score, like the highest rated one yet. Um, and so they're able to still knock the, and to the point it frustrates critics because like, yeah, Marvel did it again. Great. Marvel, the Marvel formula works again. And well, it's an ever evolving formula. That's the beauty of it is that, you know, it, it goes from can do very different things. But um, I, I, it's interesting that we do sports do spoilers on far from home. Sure. Sure. So, you know, at the very, very end, you have the, the last scene is Nick Fury in space with a bunch of scroll building spaceships and stuff, which seems to be like, that was our sort of Thanos sort of moment of what's next, you know, what's going to be the, what's phase, the end of phase four going to be or phase five, you know, what's that going to be? And, and is it, are we going to get to big galactic war kind of thing? Which, yeah, seems like it is. Uh, no. uh, absolutely. Okay. 
<laughs> so I mean, I mean yeah, yeah. no, look, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I loved, loved, loved Far From Home. I loved that moment. I loved uh, uh, the, 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 the twist with the scrolls uh, because it set up the scrolls as what I like them to be, as opposed to another movie that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> uh, well, and you know what was? You heard that what they almost did with Mysterio? No, no. Mysterio earlier on was a talk of him making him a scroll. Oh, interesting. Which shows us the idea of scroll, f- and they made an illusion in in Far From Home about like a scroll faction or this the idea that we're going to get a scroll war. Yeah, which and and that what we want. That's all yeah. I need. We did a lot of image rehab with Far From Home. Just give me a bad scroll, and then, and then we're back to where back to where I need them. Yep, our first time ever being introduced to the scrolls. Yep. <laughs> first time, never seen them before. Yep, 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 yep. Cool. So, uh, man, it's going to be an interesting, you know, this next year, you know, between Mandalorian and then which comes first, Mandalorian or Falcon Winter Soldier? Falcon uh, Winter Soldier know. is fall twenty twenty. Oh, okay. So, so Mandalorian this year. Mandalorian, yeah, because Disney Plus is later twenty nineteen. Uh, for the record, launch title is Mandalorian. I think it'll be that's the artwork. I think it'll be early Disney Plus, dude. Uh, for the record, uh, more excited about the Mandalorian than maybe all of the Marvel stuff combined. Uh, the Mandalorian specifically, we're looking at uh, essentially the first wide open uh playing field for a non Lucas uh set of artists to play in in the star wars universe it 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 uh, by by being totally divorced from the skywalker series or from rebels or for uh from the clone wars uh i uh i i have very high hopes for the fact that this sounds like a very simple narrative we're looking at space westerns being their space western nest and i'm super stoked yeah i i'm um, yeah you know, I think Favreau was a really good choice. You know, I think Favreau, when he's really, really good, is really, really good. Favreau, you know, is is done great by Marvel, either through direction and, and you know, just being a presence there and to see him working in Star Wars. And, and David Filoni is really involved, who I thought there was some really good, you know, Clone War stuff. Uh yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I hope. I mean, I was excited about when Rebels was going to come out. Um, I liked uh, Rebels. Yeah. Uh, liked. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and Star Wars for me is a larger property. It's like, you know, one day someone's going to flip that switch and someone's going to do something amazing beyond everything. And it's like, I've liked the movies, but uh, uh, the larger promise of like, Oh no! Wait, like, you know, Star Wars is is like Game of Thrones, where it's like there's a million different stories you can I mean, tell. There's a million different people that that don't have anything to do with this one thing. Whether or not people will be able to do it, we'll see. I am hoping that the Mandalorian is the Incredible Hulk. There's a dude. He's on the run. He's on the outskirts of society. We don't know why. Every week, he finds himself in a different situation to help or not help someone, and to. Uh, like uh, I don't know something about the throwback to the you know the the branded or whatever. Uh, I I love the possibility and and hopefully yeah. it'll be great. Uh, all right, there was one more movie that was announced. Well, actually two more, but uh, uh, Taika Waititi returns for Thor: Love and Thunder. Uh, very very eighties uh, uh, title here. Uh, very much in the vein of. Ragnarok, and we find out that Natalie Portman will be back, and we will see Jane Foster become Lady Thor. Yes, I'm in. Yep, and on all of it, it's like the whack. Like this is something where it's like if you would have said in any other in anyone else's hands, like oh, we're doing Natalie Portman as Lady Thor, I'd be like okay. But with Taika Waititi, I'm like, yep. Go ahead. Take this. Take this silly old boat wherever you want to. Wherever you want to take it. I would. I would say that uh, in most cases, when a Marvel director is returned, that it's even been even better work. You know, 
when they they're second and third, like the Russo brothers for sure. Uh, John Watts, I thought, you know, great work there. I think, uh, yep. Avengers two. Well, we haven't seen Taika's second movie yet. Uh, I, I, yeah, well, I mean, the Russo brothers with their Avengers movies. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not an Ultron fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it improved upon Avengers, the first one, but, uh, for the most part. So yeah, I'm excited. I, I, I wasn't as in love with game of, Th- uh, game of Thrones. uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy two, to be honest with you. Sure. You know, but... Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that it, it, it is a better uh, movie than the first one at the very least. I don't think that that's oh. controversial. Yeah. Maybe not a controversial take. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So cool. What, and, anything else? Uh, uh, there are a few more then, things in the face. Well, yeah, we, we have the, what if animated thing, which I think that's uh, just for anybody who's a nerd. That's Brad. That's what if is is always one of the one of the coolest Marvel comic conventions. Glad to see that there. Uh, also and then there would the... it'll be an animated series. And from this this I don't know this blurb, they're saying that I guess all of these Marvel Disney Plus series will be considered part of the MCU. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be animated and it's going to have a lot of the original voice talent at the very least for did, uh, did, to did, these stories. Did you see who's voicing the Watcher there? Jeffrey Wright. Yeah, Jeffrey Wright. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's awesome. uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Hawkeye's got a thing. I don't care. Um, moving on. That Unless font, anybody's though. got a fat cake. <laughs> that font looks like a rom com. Yeah, it looks I mean, like his I, talk show. I don't know what is happening. You want to know? I mean, I'm more in for a documentary series about Jeremy Renner flipping houses and making Imagine Dragons <laughs> music than I am anything to do with Hawkeye. Um, Fair enough. So, whatever. Uh, the big tease was Blade. Marahusha, Marahusha Ali is going to resurrect the Blade franchise. Uh, all in on that. Uh, and then uh, they did tease that, well, we don't have enough time to talk about the Fantastic Four or mutants. Didn't say X-Men. That we didn't have time to talk about the mutants uh, during this panel. So you can... I, mean, I would get if you were to put money on whether or not we are going to see outward hints, if not, uh, uh, you know, a post cameo moment with Fantastic Four or or X Men. What would you say in Phase Four? Are we going to see teases to one or both of those? I mean, we, we we've got to. I'm I'm bummed because uh, uh, Jason Murphy and I were speculating wildly about how great would it be if instead of doing a Fantastic Four movie, what if they just did a Doom movie and make us believe in Doom as a credible, you know, heir to a, a, a small Eastern European country and so on. And then He had a lot of good points, Brian. What, yeah. What's that? Doom had a lot of good points. Oh, yeah, yes, good... exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, oh, uh, I, I don't know. Plus, also, it's like, now that, now that we had Captain Marvel set in the 90s, I would love to see a 1960s-based period piece just like we did with captain america with the fantastic four but i don't know we'll find out i mean for doom there is you know if you need somebody else to be your next thanos yep yep but yeah that's the thing it's like thanos didn't need a movie thanos's movie were the big the big uh you know infinity war and, and endgame one of the fun things you could play with with Doom is in an era where, as a society, we're dealing with the concept of fake news and propaganda and stuff. Um, you know, he has a country in a bottle. And of course, one of the plot lines in the comic books was that, you know, he full on died, but had a plan in place for all of his robot doppelgangers to keep the idea that he was alive going and then select a. 12 year old kid to brainwash into fully believing he's doom. And then as a result, the man could die, but, but the office does not. Um, that would be a really fun thing for them to play with over two or three movies. But uh, I don't know if, I don't know if we'll, we'll see it. I'm sure we'll see something, but yeah, no, I think that's a great, I mean, get into a more complex bill and do Dune. Doom. <laughs> Dr. The Doom. Quizette's out of uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, he would be wonderful. I yeah, I think Fantastic Four in the in, in the post Guardians Thor Ragnarok age, I could see a wonderful, wonderful Fantastic Four movie. 
Um, and I think it could be a, just a neat opportunity to, to go in a slightly different direction we've seen before. So I'm excited. And yeah, the use of mutants, because that was the term they couldn't use before because Fox owned the rights to call them the mutants and stuff. And now that we're getting that. Um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, speaking of which, do you think new mutants will ever make it to theaters? I mean, look, uh, when the money factory runs <laughs> runs out of. Uh, no, uh, no. The, the one that shot. Oh, I oh I actually don't know anything about this. Yeah, so they shot a New Mutants movie that was like a horror sort of kind of scary sort of with uh, Sophie. No, wait, no, who was in it? It was uh, uh, it was supposed to get released Maisie last Williams? year, and it got pushed. And so this says uh, now it's at April third, twenty twenty, starring Anya Taylor Joy, Maisie Williams, Charlie Heaton, and some more. Yeah, apparently I had to do reshoots and other stuff, and I wonder, I wonder what happens with that because, uh, in in the chat, gambling man is saying Stephen Colbert is Mister Fantastic. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, first of all, of course, I think he's referencing the fact that Stephen Colbert played a knockoff of Mister Fantastic on the Venture Brothers. If you guys have seen that, uh, but separately, uh, Jason Murphy was pointing out that if you look at Fantastic Four comic books nowadays, they've evolved the face of Reed Richards. And he says, if you look at it now, it is very clear that they're drawing John Krasinski and that uh, and that it sounds to me like like a decision long in advance to tee up John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic. Oh, I don't think I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't. That may be where the artists were going, but I don't think that's an MC. I mean, remember Krasinski's. By the time they get to this, how old is John Krasinski going to be? And you're going to probably an appropriate start... age for Mr. Fantastic, <laughs> like, like late, uh, late, late, late thirties, early forties. <laughs> oh, he's in his forties, you know. But I, I think that remember Krasinski was up for Captain America. Oh, I, I, I didn't hear about that. Oh yeah, he was. He was one of the 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 choices. For it. I, I guess. I mean, Place I, that yeah. long term oh, it... money, folks. Place that long term money there. <laughs> yeah, make make yourself rich. Yeah, I love Krasinski. Man, it looks like it looks like they're casting Jason Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's how Jason Murphy sees himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is looking like John Krasinski. <laughs> yeah, looks in the mirror and gives himself the Jim from the Office shrug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, who knows what they'll do? I always like the idea of starting off when they're younger, you know, and watching us grow with them as they, you know, deal with those issues. But the idea, but would you say, Brian, like starting like midlife crisis sort of Fantastic Four could be you know, like they. They were something kind of a minor thing in the 60s, and they went off exploring space and got lost and come back. Well, and, and that, that's what I'm hoping is for some kind yeah. of fish. Yeah, and again, it's a familiar trope, but it's like I would love to watch that optimistic uh, uh, Cold War era mid-60s, and then whatever, they get caught in a, a, a time vortex, that, and suddenly you know, they're in modern day. Or, or maybe they were even like super hot crap back in the 60s. You know, We see them with on the Merv Griffin show or whatever, and then uh, – and then and then they go on an adventure that lands them in modern day. Uh, yeah. Here's all I'll say is that there's quite a lot of talk, not only in Far From Home and Endgame, but also the title of the Doctor Strange movie. Uh, look at that, though. Look, look at those pictures side by side. Actually, that does look a lot like Jeff. Come Jeff on, man. <laughs> it does. A lot of talk about multiverses. If they are going to bring in... Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom, Secret Wars involves. Don't don't, the don't you do this! Don't don't you do this! Don't you talk with this heart! Don't don't. Uh, there's a second grade Bryden who's gonna be real upset if he's being toyed with. I would think it would probably be the more recent version of it that they did, but yeah, because uh, yeah. the original the original I loved, and I remember reading the comic, and he sits down at the machine like straight out of like you know forbidden planet and he gets the black suit and i'm like oh this is cool you know well, i hope he keeps it um what, what could go wrong but it was so soap opera it was really a lot of talky 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 kind of on a desolate sort of world kind of thing and not as cinematic sure yeah uh, uh but, but the uh, this would this would be this would be the 2015 2015 yeah. secret. oh got it i thought you were talking about the original no. Uh, the original, uh, uh, w w what I remember is, to be honest, it almost reminds me of uh, Lost. Like, mm -hmm. you take all the heroes and villains, you throw them on an island, 
They all worry about what the other is up to. I mean, there's a lot to work with here. I, I feel like the Marvel engine could make a pretty great Secret Wars story. I mean, look, uh, it involves the folding into multiverses, and that not only means that you can do all the stuff here, but maybe mm. you see the comeback of characters that are dead. You can Ooh. see a lot of different things. You could, okay, I hear it. So what, what Justin's getting at here is... Once you bring in the multiverse in the bigger, much, much bigger multiverse, not just the one that just mildly different of what we saw like in Avengers Endgame is, yes, the multiverse where the Fantastic Four were a bunch of real dudes, where right. X-Men were there. And also, it, also I, I, all of the realities from the what if stories. If there's yep. a particular what if story that just knocks it dead, like, oh, my God, steampunk Wolverine is joining Secret oh, Wars. The, the one character I, I want them to bring in there is I want Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. I want Logan. Yeah, I want, uh, I want that, Logan. That'll be a and great you, surprise. And then coming unglued as old man Logan, you know, is dropped into the battle. Oh. Or or even some other Marvel story where all of a sudden we get like a Terminator sort of lightning storm ball explodes and, it, you know, this tractor trailer Chuck's missing part of it. There's a naked, you know, hey, he's fit. Hugh Jackman gets up uh, a la Terminator and he just somehow got pulled in, you know, by the beyond. Yeah, or somebody. I want I want some excuse where it's like you got you got old man Logan uh, and from an alternate universe, uh, Tony Stark. Sets him up with nano part of he's wearing a suit of armor and like 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 they just everybody goes all in on Wolverine to save the day at the end they all loan them their best he's got Captain America's shield it'd be amazing I'll tell you what, you could do literally you could do an entire phase out of Secret Wars like you yes could literally, uh, congratulations all the Marvel movies from now for the next three years are going to be different two hour installments of Secret Wars a okay yeah. yeah. Hey, well, I got a go. pick. We solved it. Uh, I have a pick. It's a movie that came out a long time ago, and it holds up. My children hated it. They kept asking if they could leave, and I said, you do whatever you want. And they're like, no, but you'll judge me if I leave. And I was like, eh, that's a thing. Uh, I think it's remarkable storytelling. I think it's a bummer that it isn't as well-beloved as uh, and remembered as I perceived it upon a second viewing uh go watch castaway by, with tom hanks it's great it's great robert zemeckis does a fantastic job of storytelling um man so much gets conveyed without words and that's a hard thing to do it's great yeah no castaway's fun man uh hey my pick's a podcast it's called uh, the political orphanage with andrew heaton uh he Hells is yeah. a friend uh, who has relaunched a show. It's very much, I think, uh, uh, for those uh, for, for those of us who like talking about political things but don't like having to uh, uh, understand that this is a, a, a red team, blue team fight, that uh, he is, Heaton, I think, is unleashed in this version of a podcast in talking long form about what he enjoys talking about the most, which is, policy and unintended consequences and what you would do and what you wouldn't do. Uh, this last episode that he did about um, the the wage gap and, and specifically using the news hook of the uh, women's soccer team, I think is a great sober discussion of, uh, of, of that topic uh, using a lot of really cool uh, information and perspectives. And also it involves a 10 minute joke about giving horses LASIK eye surgery. <laughs> Uh, it looks like the cool. easiest way to find it is through his uh, his Patreon. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. Patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I don't... The Lion King? You can recommend I it. I was going to save The Lion King for my After Things pick, but um, I'm trying to think what else I've seen lately. Um, <laughs> okay, this is dumb. Uh, I was in a Discord server and we were chatting about something and uh, one thing led to another, and I definitely spent a lot of the weekend binging um, old seasons of The Real Housewives of New York. Who and, boy? Um, it is, uh, uh, it's weird going back to it. I In high school, I was really into it for a few years, and then kind of dropped off almost entirely when I was out in college and, and, and got graduated. 
And uh, it's it, it's interesting. It, it, it was a very similar experience to going back and watching Iron Chef at the beginning because you kind of saw like they were still not sure how they were shooting it and they weren't sure like how much, you know, uh, how much they wanted the people on the show wanted to like promote their own stuff and their own products and own brands. Um, and then skipping forward to like the more recent days and it's like it's a machine, right? Like it's all about people. It's about scenes and getting people in the room. Uh, and, and so I don't know, I'm, I'm watching it because I think I might have it as a subject on my podcast at some point, uh, because the New York one especially has weird, like, has a weird relationship to the idea of exploitation, especially because like, there's like, oh, you're an alcoholic and you know, you drink too much, but then in one of the trips they go to Mexico and and you can visit a tequila plant and they drink the entire time. And so it's it's very weird just to, to, to watch the show about people who you kind of can't relate to and that's why it's okay to watch them fight and kind of exploit themselves. Um, but when you can relate to like issues of alcoholism or, or you know, not having a large S of money, um, it's a it's a weird feeling. So I don't know. I've that that's kind of been something I've been looking at. at uh, Hulu has like all of it, um, like all the new. They are new. They're back in DC now. They're it, that doesn't mean anything to you guys. I was okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, it 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 was it's it's just it's been an interesting thing. Um, uh, the Real Housewives. So. Um, I just got a weird thing in my RSS feed, and it's it's my pick from twenty twenty three whoa what it's really weird it's a spider-man movie now this is the weird part because it sounds familiar you know spider peter parker adjusts and he encounters uh, a mentor from another universe well that was far from home or spider-man in the spider-verse you know that was actually the plot line of both of those hmm. this is weird oh um a mysterious man named logan huh i wonder what this is <laughs> so so your pick is <laughs> 2023's Spider-Man, in which he he uh, uh, learns from uh, Logan. Spider-Man Logan, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome to my fantasy pick. You know, come on, <laughs> Spider-Man Wolverine movie. Uh, no, um, I uh, I've been listening to and really enjoying. I've been, and this is sort of an update, and and that is the history of the again. I am bad with titles. Um, the book is. The the History of the Future by Blake J. Harris, who wrote Console Wars, which I've talked about before, which is the story of Oculus. And very, very good behind the scenes, Oculus getting its start, Palmer Lucky, John Carmack. I'm at the point now where Facebook acquires them. And it's a very interesting topic because it's, you know, just a really good behind the scenes sort of thing because I think Oculus was one of the biggest acquisitions you know, that non-social media sort of acquisitions in recent history and, um, you know, kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, just fast. You know, they were less than two years old by the time Facebook came in and bought them for $3 billion, which fast. So there you go. It's my pick. History of the future. Right on. It's been after. Yes, it has. All right. Hey, that's a show. Yay! Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Justin, Andrew, thank you for being on, as always. Oh, no problem. We love it. Uh, Justin, you got a stream today? No stream today. Uh, doing a jury episode and then uh, just grinding it out, working on all sorts of fun stuff. Hey, Sign, nice. uh, what kind of job did you get? Congratulations, he, by the way. He got a job at a startup. He oh, was, right on. He was... Uh, talking about it in the discord they've got like that's the, the good news the bad tables. news is he's getting paid in fake coin oh um, no <laughs> it's a real coin though <laughs> uh very cool andrew got any plans for a periscope or something this week uh i've got to do some media stuff so excited oh, yeah. about that i've got a couple interviews coming up and got to get things ready for that so, so follow, follow your twitters at andrew main yeah i'm on twitters i'm on twitters, twitters. Right i'm gonna try to pop it into a periscope too so very nice. Uh, all righty. Well, we'll be back in a couple hours for Court Killers. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Bye. There you go. Bye. XOXO. Bye.